What's up, Sifters? It's Tuesday. That can mean one thing. It is Game Face. Lucky number 21, Matt. You feeling lucky today? Very lucky. <laughs> That's good. We have an awesome show. It's been a crazy week in games. First of all, tons of big games coming yeah. out. I mean, it's been a big, Finally. big week. Finally, yeah. I mean, we're now into the rush of Q4 games. Uh, three big games came out, Until Dawn, Madden. You were seeing the reviews for Metal Gear now. Mm -hmm. Um, just an update on that. I just got Metal Gear. We are not a part of the big event that they had for the reviews. We're the little guy now, Matt. Yeah. We don't get to go to all the cool stuff anymore. I, we're old, though. We like yeah. to stay home. <laughs> I, I would prefer to stay home. I would have I would have liked more to get the review up on Embargo, though, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, that would be nice. It would be nice to have that. But, but uh, God sounds, willing... Sounds like it was uh, quite the marathon, though. Yeah. To that event. That yeah. It's a big game. It is a big game. Well, through. a couple of outlets have actually like said they're not going to put the review up because they well, obviously they haven't been able to play online. But you, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can wait. And well, anyway, we'll wait. We're going to talk yeah, about we'll the there. Metal Gear reviews. We'll get to that. We have plenty of other big topics to get to as well. Uh, we are going to talk about most of the big games that came out. We're not going to talk about Madden. I had actually kind of had that on the docket, and then mm -hmm. I removed it last minute. We're I figured talk about Madden the motion picture. Yeah, Madden the movie. <laughs> I, I want, don't even play Madden, and I want to buy the game just to reward them for that video. Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 had a, I had a good time. Yeah, that. Madden the movie was pretty good. They did a pretty good job on that. Colin uh, Kaepernick as uh, Al Pacino, as his character from Sen of a Woman. I'm, I'm, that's I'm pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. That that's so, I don't know who came up with that one. But it's so bravo. meta, yeah. <laughs> bravo, sir or madam, whoever, figured, whoever came up with that one. And I am like a big sports guy, but I also understand our audience, and I know that most of you guys do not care about sports, and you probably care even less about sports video games, so we did cut the Madden discussion from today's show. But you should watch that video yeah. if you haven't already. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't watched the Madden, if you, you don't care about sports, you should watch Madden the movie trailer. It's just completely wacky and offbeat. So definitely recommend watching that. I... Look for our Game Eval of Madden. I'm still going to publish the Game Eval, even though it'll probably get the lowest views of any Game Eval we ever published this year. <laughs> still going to do it just because I'm playing the crap out of it, and I'm really liking it as well. It's so your site. You gotta, you do what I you can want. do whatever the hell you I want, Matt. It's good to be king. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a site, I'd just be Yakuza reviews all day. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually news came out today about Yakuza yeah. is coming out yeah. in the West very soon. So anyway, we've got a lot to get to, so let's do it. Let's get to the Big Six. All right, so I feel like we've been talking about Windows 10 on this show literally the yeah. last like month straight. But for whatever reason, the news just will not stop coming with Windows 10. Um, last week, obviously, we talked about piracy related to mm -hmm. Windows 10. This week, we're actually going to talk about another element of it that was discovered this week, and that is that apparently Windows 10 will not work with a lot of the popular DRM protocols uh, secure ROM, ROM safe, disk. safe disk, and I, I did see there was like someone figured like a workaround for I think secure ROM today. Like it was like when you sent me that, like I, I looked it up and it was like seven hours ago. Someone was like, I figured it out, but you know who knows if that's going to be universal or if it only works for a couple things or like it's a really disturbing idea that even on PC now our games might not always work. Well, see, here's the thing though is like look. They've always had ways to get around secure ROM yeah. and, and safe disk. They found hacks for it. But it gets to the place where is it worth the effort? Because most people, it's like, oh, they find that old game that they have and they, they pull it out of their drawer or out of their closet or wherever they have it, have it stashed. And it's like an impulse thing. It's like an impulse buy. Mm -hmm. It's like you see that game, you're like, oh, yeah, I love that game. And what do you, you want to go pop it in and play it. You're not probably mm -hmm. even interested in playing the whole game or finishing it. Maybe you're trying to finish it after you stopped playing it the first time. Or you just want to hear that title screen music. Like Fantasy Star Online. Yeah. <laughs> perfect, perfect game for just hearing the title screen music. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, the, the, the thing is, is like you're not pulling that game out to spend a ton of time with it. So the investment that it takes for you to go and Google it and find mm -hmm. out what the hack is. And then, look, a lot of... There's a huge barrier of entry there is what I'm getting at. And for most people, that barrier of entry right now is too much. Mm -hmm. And as time goes on, it's probably only going to become bigger. So 
What we're staring at here, Matt, is games like Spore that we're showing right now. That is one of the games that's already been confirmed that will no longer work on Windows 10 right now. And in fact, all the games that we're going to show you during this segment are games that have been confirmed to be having issues with Windows 10, and Spore is one of them. What we're looking at is that there are going to be a lot of games that like, you're never going to be able to play again. And so it, it becomes a question of preserving the history of our industry in some way. Mm -hmm. and a concern with being able to preserve the history of our industry. Yeah, I mean, I I ran into this a little bit in a different, maybe less, I don't know, maybe less insidious way, but it's like, it was a similar thing where I, you know, I cleaned out a whole bunch of old games out of my uh, old room up in my parents' house, and uh, there were tons, because I had a Mac in, in college, I had tons and tons of Mac games, and not a single one, so I have like this stack of like probably 50 or something Mac games, classics, and none of them will work because they're all OS 7 and nothing, none of that works past the Intel Macs. You know, none of them can run that. And it's the same thing. It's like, I can't, I can never play. I'm like, are these even worth anything? What do you do? Like, and, you know, I've, I have a lot of PC games like that too. I have Spore. I have the collector's edition of Spore. Yeah, me too. And I do actually go back to that game once in a while and play it because I think it's enjoyable if you detach yourself from the hype. But like, what you're like, that's... Here's, here's the thing that's really bothersome, and people will notice this as they watch this segment and see the games that we're showing, is that, look, these, these aren't, aren't little these games. Aren't, one, they're not little games at all. I mean, one, obviously, we're looking at Mass Effect right now. The first Mass Effect won't work with Windows 10 right now as we speak. Mm. But they're also games that aren't that old. Yeah. It's like, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I can't play like the old King's Quest or the old Doom or whatever. No, we're not even talking about games like that. We're talking about games that have been released in the last, like, decade or even less in some cases. So, yeah. to me, it's a big concern. And Microsoft has just kind of blown it off and said, oh, you know, it's kind of not our problem. Is, and it, is it intentional or it just happens to be Windows 10 doesn't play nice with these? It, it's just that Windows 10 doesn't play nice. Mm -hmm. And basically what Microsoft has said is that, like, well, basically what we've had to do in Windows 10 that is consequently keeping these games from working is something that we just can't really remove from Windows 10 and so you know people are left trying to find hacks the original Bioshock is another game wow that yeah it, it's another game it's not working with Windows 10 right now I mean that game is a classic like yeah. It's, it's also only eight years old. Right, that's what I'm saying like these games aren't that old and they're already like almost becoming obsolete and so we're getting in this very weird place with our medium that we love so much where it's different from everything else. Music, you can still have an LP. You can still have an LP that plays on 78 RPM mm. and still play. And those records were from like the 40s and 50s. I have a few of those. Yeah, and you can still they play still them. They still work. They st and yeah. they still work. TV shows, they're all archived on YouTube. They're going to be there forever. I mean, you look, movies, I mean, they just get transferred from one medium to the next over and mm. over again. And so... It is getting, to me, to a place where it's actually legitimately scary that some of these great games, like, you know, our kids, if we had kids, may not be able to play some of our favorite games from when mm. we were, I mean, from when we were growing up. I mean, those games are almost guaranteed now to not play. I mean, if, as you start running out of these machines and these machines die, even consoles eventually. Mm -hmm. are we, eventually, our society is going to get to a place where there is not another NES, like... Or if there is, yeah, they're going to be in a museum somewhere. Yeah. Well, I'm interested to see, like, like, because you know, there, the argument can be made that like there's sort of this lag time where a lot of these games just don't work anymore for whatever reason, and now you can't play them anymore. But then they come back. You know, GOG has started to bring back a lot of these right. games. So like, you know, and a lot I, of them DRM free. DRM free. All of them DRM free on right. GOG. And like, you can, you know, I haven't played X Wing and Tie Fighter in forever, and there they are. Now you can play them. Um, so maybe, like, is there going to be this lag time where we have to wait for these games to get old enough for a service like that to kind of strip them of that, make them work on modern OSs, and say, here you go, like, here's your archival copy, basically. Yeah. And then, of course, you run into the problem of, like, you know, EA is involved in GOG, but, are, you know, Mass Effect, you know, EA putting, like, Starflight on GOG is very different from EA putting Mass Effect sure. on GOG. Oh, you know? yeah. So you got to wonder if there's, like... You know, is there is there a lag time for that? Is there a space we have to accept that there's going to be these like sort of mid-range aged games that like have to wait to kind of cycle into the classic age game category, or like is this something? You know, how do you fix that? How do or you, how, how, if you look at it this way, how quickly they're remastering games now? Maybe we don't have true. anything to worry about. Yeah, maybe we'll get Bioshock <laughs> Remaster Collection and it won't matter. But like, 
until Windows 10.5 where they break that again. You know, it, it's, but the other thing too is that like a lot of times games that are in my old library, a lot of times I don't want. They're not the AAA games that I go back and want to play again. They're like the quirky like games that weren't big, like mm-hmm. um, Space Station Silicon Valley for the yeah. N64. Just little like. Which is unwinnable. It is, right. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's a cartridge and you can't update it. But there's everything has its downsides. Yeah, yeah. But there's these tons of like little games that maybe did a concept really cool, didn't really flesh it out. Like Zack and Wiki. Do you remember that game? Yeah, I remember that. Like that was really really good. Right. But like this one of the it's like a niche game. Like the chance of that game ever being remastered or put in a collection or ending up on good old games. No, it's Capcom. It's Right. Yeah. <laughs> they barely get Mega Man collections out these days. Right. So the chances of that are so slim, and those are generally the games that I want to go back and try to play again, mm-hmm. like after an extended period of time, just to even experience that concept and maybe see how that game, like Kill Dot Switch, like it's kind of been yeah. back in the news this week because you know Gears of War came out mm-hmm. and Cliff Blazinski went on Twitter and started sharing all these stories about the original Gears and like the inspiration. He talked about Kill Dot Switch, but like. That and like Winback is another game. Mm-hmm. Like those two games are like the first games that really did cover systems for third-person shooters. And so every once in a while, like those are the type of games I want to go back and just like pick up and be yeah. like, Winback's one of the reasons I still have an N64. Yeah, just in case I ever want to go. And that game was long. That was that was, yeah. a, that, was that game really solidified the cover shooter years before even Kill Switch did it. And it's. It's a part of history. Nobody knows it's there. And then there's a game. There's another game called Hybrid Heaven, which yeah, was like that. a fighting game RPG. Mm-hmm. Like still, that genre really hasn't been done. So, you know, there's just these. There's so many little gems that are from the past. That it, this is what really got me concerned. That those games may fall by the wayside and just become invisible mm-hmm. and, and no longer a part of kind of the lexicon lexicon of gaming. And I I kind of worry in the sense that. Um, I kind of, because the internet is so ubiquitous, sometimes I have that feeling of like, oh, should I save this thing or should I record this or take a picture of this or whatever? It's like, well, no, like a hundred other people on the internet are going to do that. Yeah. And like, sometimes that's not true. No, you're like, right. Yeah. You might really be the, the only, only one person, who cares yeah. about hybrid heaven. Like <laughs> that right. might, you know. I think people watching preservative... this right now are like, I've never heard of hybrid I'm heaven. I'm sure so. some of them have. Whereas like, I, you know, I, I still have it. I yeah. have my copy. I remember it and I enjoy it. But like. Would it ever occur to me to necessarily save it in case someone ever needs that code again to preserve it in a museum? Or a something? lot of people would never. Think I wouldn't that. think of that. Yeah. I mean, now I would because you said it. But like, but now maybe people like us are on guard because yeah. this is happening, and you know, I would never count on consoles to be the thing that hold. I mean, look, eventually we're gonna get to a place where, like, if a console isn't online, it yeah. may not work at all. Yeah, I've, I've been through. My, I mean, I've been through what three or four different cars since my Dreamcast was purchased. Right. My Dreamcast still works. Yeah. But how long is it going to How work? long is how long are those motors going to function? I wonder how know? many original PlayStation still work. Not mine. Because I had three or four <laughs> yeah, before I, I finally put them out to pasture. So I had I had the, well, the original one with the X the separate RCA things and like yeah, well, yeah. It became like super valued by DJs and yeah, like yeah. like that supposed like audiophile music quality. Yeah. And that thing died after, you know, I was doing, you know, you do the thing where you hold it, you flip it upside down. Or you so. put it sideways, like, yeah. <laughs> up against like a bottle of beer on your coffee table. That is one of the greatest things in gaming, I think, is all the weird solutions people come up with the to hacks. like, you know, that or wrapping the Xbox 360 in a towel. And yeah, like, yeah. All, there's, there, there's some great things where you just want to, it's like the first person who ate an artichoke. Who figured that out? Like, yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's like, who, deci- who decided, I don't know what to do. I'm going to wrap my 360 in a towel and just see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, even going back to, like, the Atari 2600, I remember I was going through the analog, well, they're not analog sticks, but the joysticks. Yeah. Like, I was breaking them constantly. Gosh, or, like, yeah. people would come over and twist them and break them, and my dad would just screw, finally was just like, I'm just going to screw a bolt in this thing. And he just Ooh. literally just screwed a bolt down into the plastic, and I, it never broke again. <laughs> Blowing into cartridges on the NES. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of fun little things that people have done. The crooked cart on the N64 that people mm-hmm. used to hack N64 games. You're right. That's a whole other topic, yeah. though. But, you know, before we move on, I just I want to say that I'm legitimately scared that, like, a big part of my childhood and my past could just disappear mm. forever. And it's all because of an operating system. Yeah. Well, it's also, like, it, it speaks to a larger problem in the gaming medium, I think, where we, you know, even people who love it like we do, I think, still kind of fall into this trap of considering it a very temporal medium in the sense that we're always on to the next new, next big thing. And while we have nostalgia and love for these old games, it's hard to go back and play that because that's the thing about, like you mentioned, LPs and movies. Someone who watches, you know, uh, like, you know, Bachelor in the Bobby Sox or the movie today or listens to, like, an, a really old, you know, blues album or something today, 
they're getting the exact same experience as someone really who listened to that or watched that back when it was recorded yeah, yeah. or created. Whereas, try to sit someone who was born in 1995 down to play Metal Gear One yeah. on the MSX. Well, I think, like, I think a, movies. I, like, there's, like, this is the only entertainment or, or art medium where I think even the best of the best of its era can't then be experienced in the same way by someone who lived through a later era because yeah. it's it's such a temporal thing like the graphics change and the game I would say some change. movies are that way like any movie that relies heavily on special effects or CG it can be yeah but like in in the end like you know those rely on story and sound and you know music is universal whereas like you know how you play a game evolves not not just by the generation but by the month sometimes it does and yeah. You know, it's it's hard to kind of look at these things sometimes as something that need to be needs to be preserved because it's easy to fall into that trap of like, well, who's going to want to play that in thirty years? Yeah. But like, that's exactly what led to so many silent films being lost in the old days, where like, every, no one understood why anyone would ever want to see these things again. Right. And you know, finding a, a lost silent film or finding a lost episode of Doctor Who. Which many are missing. Which are gone for gone good. Forever. Some of them, yeah. Like they're all gone. Think about like that. A bunch of yeah. bunch of those classics are gone because like they taped over them or something. Yeah. And it's like that attitude of like, well, who who's gonna care? Like in thirty years, like we should know better than that. Yeah. By now. We and I feel like lessons, we yeah. don't. I feel yeah. like too many of us don't. Yep. So. Moving on, as we mentioned earlier, Metal Gear Solid Five. The reviews have been coming out. They actually started coming out yesterday, and yeah, uh, at least yesterday, yeah. Yeah, and uh, they've actually kind of wrapped up now. It appears that everybody mm. who went and reviewed the game at the event has kind of put their reviews yeah. up. Now. There's still some people who are doing like impressions and full review later, but yeah, like we were talking about earlier, the, obviously Metal Gear Online is not coming online until October. I think it is. And that was October first. Whole... I think it all is. this shit with Konami and people accusing Konami of stuff all year, and the thing they finally respond to is that i know <laughs> it's funny. it is funny oh. yeah but uh so the reviews have been coming out the reviews have been absolutely glowing uh, just astounding i mean to a perfect 10 from i think both GameSpot and ign i don't know if Has that, that ever is, happened maybe I, with ocarina of time, ocarina of time maybe I, yeah because i know i know GameSpot gave ocarina a 10 i'm mm-hmm. not 1000 percent certain on ign but that maybe i don't the, remember people screaming at ign so i'm gonna guess they gave it a 10 but i might be wrong so let's think about that first of all. That we're, we're we're putting right now we're putting Metal Gear Solid Five in the same company as Ocarina of Time, mm-hmm. which I, you know I've just started Metal Eddie. Gear, but it is going to have to do something, a lot of things, amazingly well for yeah. me to ever consider it to be in the same stratosphere as, as the Ocarina. game that invented the Z. The Z Lock, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That, that people still talk about to this day when they demo their games. They're like, yeah. oh, I actually just watched like a walkthrough for a game the other day where the guy's like, oh, we have Zelda's Z-targeting. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, as far as the critics are concerned, this game is kind of hovering in that same atmosphere as Ocarina of Time. Yeah. Here's the thing that's kind of has me wondering, and again, I've just started it, so I have no, no skin in this game whatsoever. The game is really getting railed for its story. By, that's almost unanimous. I haven't really read a single review yet that said the story is amazing, and I got wrapped up in it, and I totally you know, knew what was going on. Like Pretty much everyone is like, it's ham-fisted, people are constantly doing stuff that makes no sense, there's lines of dialogue that don't make any sense within the context of the story, or even the context of the conversation that the character's having. Metal Gear game confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, like, what, what, what do you expect? Like, that's, you know, I, mean, I mean, I wonder, you know, I haven't touched, I played Ground Zeroes, but I haven't touched the full version of 5, and I gotta wonder, especially reading the reviews, it seems like the story is kind of your usual Metal Gear nonsense, but even, but, but it feels sort of like, from the description, like it sort of boots you out of that open world, and it's like the story isn't in your face all the time, and it sounds like just, it's such a good game, yeah, that it doesn't really matter that the story is... Which, you know what, I'm... Typic- I'm on board I'm with that. I'm typically 100% behind yeah. that. Like, I'm a gameplay first guy because, like, I've said it a million times, like, stories in games almost always suck. Yeah, like, I'll forgive even, a lot if Even the, the good. best ones, the best stories in games still, if you hold them up to the best films, it's not even close. So, mm-hmm. and we're actually going to talk about a game that has a really good story here shortly. And, uh, so, yeah. Here's the thing, though. Most Metal Gear reviews, like, there's always a few people who will still say the story's great. 
Yeah. Because every once in a while, they'll get like a huge fan of the series to review the game, and they know everything that's happened before, and they understand the context of it. Like, look, there are some times when I'm play- I've played Metal Gear games where I'll go home and I'll play it, and I'll come into work and talk to someone like you or somebody else who maybe knows a little more about the lore than I do, and I- something will have just gone whoosh, <laughs> like right over my head. Like They're like, oh, well, how about when so-and-so said this? And like that relates back to like Peace Walker. And, and I'm just like, I had no idea that was going on. Mm-hmm. So in the past, you'd always get like a few of these people reviewing the game who would still say the story is like really good or amazing. But with this round of reviews, I don't know that I've seen a single person evaluating this game say the story was good. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, you know. Which is disappointing too, because this is like Kojima's swan song, right? Yeah, but Kojima, if Kojima's Swan Song was a really good story, that'd be pretty weird. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the Metal Gear stories. I, I think they're fun. I don't think they're good. Yeah. Not, but I think they're fun in the way like a Roger Corman movie is fun, or like a, I mean, Snake's named after the guy from uh, you know Escape from New York, is, right. you know John Carpenter. Like that's about on par with the storytelling is, yeah. in those games. <laughs> and like you know, I mean, that's the kind of thing he's going for. I think for the most part, and he doesn't try to be some kind of. You know, I think a lot of the Kojima fans hold the, those games up as like this like insanely high bar, this high drama kind of thing. But it's really just sort of like B movie melodrama, taken like writ large and shot through an anime filter. I mean, and, I would say I don't even know fun. if it's B level to be honest with you. Well, I'm trying to be nice. Yeah. But like, but at its best, you know, at its most enjoyable, I think that's what Metal Gear is, and I I have fun with those stories. I really enjoyed, uh, you know. Once I got over the shock of Raid and like you know the the the, the attempt at social commentary is a little ham fisted, yeah. but overall what they're trying to do in two in you know, Sons of Liberty was really cool. Um, I uh, I never played all the way through Snake Eater, but I did watch that little movie version of it that came yeah. that came with the limited edition. And there's some good stuff in there, like you know there's some good character work between uh, Snake and the boss and all that. And I thought four was a nice wrap up of the series, even though obviously it did not wrap up the series. <laughs> no, it was still going to be the last one, remember? But there's like you know, there's the the big fight between the two the two mechs is like a great like you know yeah. old versus new thing, and the final fight with all the music changes. Like, oh, I don't think all... there's any denying that Kojima I mean, was... knows a good set piece when he sees one. Yeah, he. I mean, I mean, he uses the medium in a way that 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 no one else uses it, and also no other medium could do. And I think that's kind of one of the th- reasons that Kojima's games hook people so well and are so well regarded by people who love video games is like, you can't make a movie that then comments on your Suikoden save. You can't, you know, make a movie that forces you to injure your arm trying to tap the button and fast enough to get through the torture sequence. Yeah, like, yeah. like, it's, it's, he, he knows how to use the medium in a way that nobody else, in some ways, has the balls to use it. Agreed, yeah. And he, and in some of his crazier ideas were shot down. I remember uh, there was a story about, um, uh, in the making of Metal Gear Solid 2, one of his ideas was that the game would cost five dollars, but if you died, the disc became worthless. Like, like, <laughs> like you, if you died, the disc stopped working, yeah. and you'd have to go buy another copy. And Konami basically said, "Are you out of your mind?" Yeah. 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 But I'm like, what an interesting idea. Concept, yeah. You know, it was that's a microtransaction before you could rely on a downloadable connection. Basically. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I um, I'm excited to play it. Yeah, but absolutely. I'm excited for it for the reasons that you mentioned, the gameplay and the mm-hmm. story. I mean, honestly, a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but people who will talk to me sometimes about Metal Gear, they'll say, oh, that one scene, like, you know, got me, like, misty-eyed or got me choked up. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I was, like, laughing through that scene. Yeah, like, I'm kind of with you on that one, but, like, I don't... I mean, some people, like, really get wrapped up in the whole yeah, mythos. And, yeah. and I think this might have a little more of a punch as well because it is Kojima's likely last Metal Gear game. And, and you got to wonder what he snuck in there. Yeah. They're like, if he knew he was... I mean, already they found in, like, Ground Zero is that thing where you're All erasing the, messages, the titles yeah. and everything. And, and I'm like, so if he knew that soon, like, you got to wonder what's in this game. There's got to be some stuff hidden deep There's in gonna this There's going to be Easter eggs yeah. coming out for this game. Maybe... Ten years from now, they're yeah, going to find I more would, Easter I eggs. I have no problem <laughs> believing that we're going to be finding stuff in Metal Gear Solid Five the decade from now. And I would love for him to do stuff like some of the older stuff that he did, where he really messed with like the hardware, like you know, switching the controllers mm-hmm. with Psycho Manus and all that. Like, I miss that in Metal Gear. I feel like he's kind of gotten away from that a little bit. There's lots of sight gags mm-hmm. and stuff like that in the games, but there's nothing that really makes use of like yeah. the hardware. In any and it way. isn't interesting. It isn't interesting. Isn't it interesting that like? Kojima is one of the only people in this industry who can 
get away with fucking with the players. You're right. Like, like usually gamers are very angry when they feel manipulated or screwed around with, but he will screw with you from the out. Like Metal Gear Solid Three, where like you had to pick which game you like better, and if you picked Metal Gear Solid Two, he like stuck the Raiden right. mask on yep. on Snake, and you're like, <laughs> wait, wait, are you gonna make me play as Raiden? Like, like that is so that's really funny to me. Yeah. I think that's really cool. He has a he lot of that. leeway to get away with it, though. He yeah, knows, and he knows it too. I mean, it's almost expected in his games at this point. He's kind of built that mythos and that pedigree yeah. with well, this there's game. there's no fourth wall whatsoever in, right. in any of these games. And he and he knows it and he uses it and he embraces it. So I'm, you know, I'm sorry to see Kojima as a triple A, you know, no no limit to the budget developer go because, like, you know, I think we're about to see something special here. I you hope know? so. So, and, and especially because I know, like, a big open world, you know, I remember he, there were stories of him seeing uh, Assassin's Creed 1 and just being like thinking like that's what he wanted to make like that's what he wanted Metal Gear Solid 4 to be and like they well it kind of is now it's an open world yeah so Stealth now here is that realization and you gotta wonder when someone like Kojima sees something like Assassin's Creed and then goes back and says I'm going to make that for me what kind of crazy stuff are we about to walk into here I, you know there's people talking about you know how like you know animal dung is useful in some way in this game. Oh yeah, the horses. The yeah. horses, when they poop, you can poop on a road, and then, we actually curated a video of this on Sifted. You, the horse will poop on the road, then you go up on a vantage point, and when a car comes by, it will spin out on the poop and wreck. <laughs> yeah. Uh... So yeah, I mean, look, we already know about some stuff that's in there. They've been doing these really cool like short promotional videos for Phantom Pain. They're literally like 20 or 30 seconds long. But it shows off just one little feature of the game. And, like, that was one of them that they showed. Uh, there was another one where Snake tossed a grenade, and then Quiet was up on a ridge with a sniper rifle. You toss the grenade, she shoots the sniper, or shoots the grenade out of the midair with the sniper rifle into a helicopter and blows the helicopter up. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm really excited to really dig into this game. Like I said, I'm just getting started on it. Um, should have a lot more to talk about with, with uh, the game for next week's show. Um, and hopefully the, our game eval will be up by then as well, so the opinion's kind of out there. But uh, just wanted to talk very quickly about everyone else's reviews, because mm -hmm. they've all been going up, and by the time we talk about our game eval, and once we've both played it, all the reviews will be yesterday's news, and obviously one of the biggest games of the year. So just want to have that discussion. I'll be interested to get your take on the story when it's all said and done. Yeah, I'm interested. I, I'm kind of, I haven't been paying a lot of attention to this game. I don't know uh, how. It has just well, been a deluge of promotion. Like if I it. haven't seen it on this show itself, or like when you talked about it, or if I haven't like seen it like kind of come up in my sift, like I really haven't been seeking out information. Yeah. Because and I do that. It's not an intentional media blackout, but it's just sort of like if there's a game where I'm like, I'm gonna buy this. Right. I'm gonna play this. Like I don't need to be convinced any. You're further. right. There's really no so point. I, in I'm watching just like I'm just gonna ignore media. you until you're out because otherwise you're just. Frustrating that I can't play you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think now that Metal Gear is out, I think No Man's Sky will be the next one on that kind of list. It's like just, just I'll, I'll see you when you're here. Well, they don't put out a ton of media for that, so you don't have to worry about that yeah. too much. Yeah, but like Metal, Metal but Gear I'm anyway. excited to kind of jump into Metal Gear with like um, you know almost almost blind. I was saying I really don't know what I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to see here. Yeah. I just liked what I tasted in Ground Zeroes, and I just hope it's bigger than I can imagine. Yeah. So. Now we're going to move, we were talking about games with stories that we don't particularly care about, but now we're going to talk about a game with a great story, in fact, and probably one of the best stories I've experienced, well, it's kind of hard to describe. It's not necessarily the best story, but it's the best way a story has been told in a game in a long time, hmm. and that game is Until Dawn, and so the game itself is pretty much like a telltale game, like it's... There's very little action or gameplay where you actually handle the gameplay. It's all about dialogue trees, making decisions, quick time events, and things like that. And where Telltale's games kind of advertise themselves as, oh, we have these branching stories, it alters like the main story arc, and it could change the ending of the story, which all ends up being a bunch of bullcrap, because it, basically what it lets you do is go off on a little capillary, on a little tangent, and mm -hmm. it ultimately brings you like right back to the main storyline. Usually, right. with Telltale's games. This game, though, I was shocked at how much the story changes permanently when you make decisions in this game. People die and never come back. Like, literally, I think... I've only played it through once. But I think, literally, based upon what I played, anybody can die. 
And like at the end of the game, you could end up with a completely different set of survivors from the time that you played it before. Like yeah. I was blown away. And look, when you make a decision, it just doesn't take you down one little like dialogue tree path and then bring you right back. Like you go off and you stay off. And the other thing I really like about it is that it makes you make split second decisions a lot in like mm -hmm. dialogue conversations where it's like make a choice and you have a certain amount of time and that choice could kill somebody. And it immediately saves, there's no going back to like a prior save, like you have to live or die as it were, with the decisions that you make in this game. And look, the story itself, the setup's very simple. It's your t traditional horror slasher flick. People do dumb stuff in this game, but what I found is that like, the game did this intentionally. It's not like it's unintentionally stupid. Like it knows it's a horror movie and it knows all the tropes of horror films and it like fiddles with them and plays around with them. Um, hmm. Like. The characters will do stuff like this really dumb. And you know, in horror movies, you're like, what are you doing? That's so stupid. It doesn't make sense. Why would you ever do that? Like, the game recognizes that it's like making the player do something or the character do something really stupid. And so it, it basically uses that as a mechanic to get a reaction out of the player. Hmm. And, uh, I've got to tell you, this is the most pleasant surprise of 2015. For yeah, myself. I'm very surprised to hear you say all that because, like, I mean, not that I had anything against the game, but I kind of had sort of slotted it into that heavy rain Everybody category. Has. You know, yeah, like, yeah. Well, look, here's the thing. It's a $60 game. It's a full mm. price game. The game, I think it took me eight hours to finish it. And I will say that as soon as I finished it, I did want to play that game again. Would I recommend somebody buys this game for the full $60? I probably wouldn't. And, you know, it's also a game I would never recommend to everybody because there's really no gameplay in it, per se. So if, mm. you, if you can't stand Telltale's games, you're not going to like this game either. Even though it has a great story and it does do all the things that I just talked about, you're not going to be able to get over the hump because, and I will say, the quick time events in this are a little smarter. They require a little better timing, a little more skill. They put you under the gun more than you see in the Telltale games. And so I do feel like they handle them better than Telltale's releases, but... Still, at the end of the day, it's most of the gameplay is related to quick time events. And some people just can't stand them, and I totally understand that. I'm pretty much at my breaking point with them as well. But if you're going to make a game like this where the game is driven by QTEs, like they have done about as good of a job with them as, mm. as I think you probably conceivably could. So I feel like Until Dawn has out telltaled Telltale. Like hmm. it is. Look, there are some stories in Telltale games that or maybe up to... Well, I would say the stories in Telltale games, some of them are better than this. Mm -hmm. But it, they're not better at actually telling the tale. It's like The Walking Dead is a great story. But the twists and turns that you take to get to the end of The Walking Dead story are nowhere near as memorable as the same from Until Dawn. And so, just really... I honestly thought this game was going to be crap. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Like... I wasn't paying attention at all. I hadn't really played the game mm -hmm. at all at trade shows or anything like that or any preview events. Like I had just, like everybody else, just watched media of it and watched a couple walkthroughs from the developers and things like that here and there. And I honestly thought I would have no interest in this game. And I was more than pleasantly surprised. So what I would say is to anybody who's watching this and you're like, well... You know, I'm kind of on the fence on these games. I kind of like The Walking Dead or A Wolf Among Us, but, you know, I don't know if I would... If you're a person who kind of likes these games, you're going to really like Until Dawn. Mm. Um, it's not going to change anyone's mind if they hate these types of games, but I think most people, no matter what, will be pleasantly surprised. And it also, you know, it doesn't get cheap. It, there are some jump scares in it. Um, but for the most part, like, it does a really good job building tension. Like, here's a really cool thing that I like about this game. There are certain parts where you need to stand still to keep from being noticed by the killer. And basically what they do is they make you hold the DualShock 4 as still as possible. Hmm. That's and you cool have idea. to it's cool and you have to hold it there really st and look it's really sensitive. It picks up on the slightest like movements and deviations. So you're sitting there like holding that controller as still as you can like holding your breath like does it like vibrate when that happens at all or No. But, so what, what stops you from just putting it on the ground? I don't know. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I never even thought of that. 
I'm a I'm a cheater at heart. Yeah, I guess. yeah. I see, know. I didn't even think of that. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I have to hold this as still as possible. So well, that's good if it, if it had sucked you in enough that you didn't even think about doing that about and breaking the, the immersion thing, like this that. This game totally sucked me. I'm a big horror fan. I'll admit it, but I'm not like a big like slasher horror fan. Like, look back when I was like in my tweens, I loved Friday the Thirteenth and the Freddy movies and all that. Mm. But now, like for horror movies, like I've kind of moved beyond that. Um, watch. Have you watched It Follows? By the way. Oh, I love It Follows. Great movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just watched it this past weekend. Anybody I saw it who, twice in the theaters. Anyone who hasn't seen that movie and even has a bit, it's not even really a horror film. No, it's. I wouldn't I, say it's, it's. I can't. You can't say much about it without yeah, ruining yeah. it. But yeah. like, it's not what you think it is. Yeah. It's not about what you think it is. Yeah, yeah. I was very, I was very happily surprised by that movie, yeah. and it was, and it's also shot in like. Uh, oh, near, near Detroit, yeah. so it doesn't look like every other LA suburb horror movie. It's also movie shot ever. very well. It's very well. I mean, it's beautifully shot, but it's also like it's that Midwestern kind of like geography that like yeah. looks it makes it look different from a lot of the other horror movies. And to bring it back movies. to games, so we don't go off on a complete yeah. tangent, the guy who did the soundtrack on that game has done soundtracks for like he's yeah. a chiptunes guy. And it's no, you notice it in the movie. Yeah, yeah. It's Disaster sure. Piece is the name mm-hmm. of the artist. You definitely notice it. Like, yeah. as soon as the movie started, I was like, dude, are they playing a chip tune? <laughs> like, and the whole soundtrack is chip tunes. Mm-hmm. And it is just moody as all get out, shot really well. Highly recommend that. But anyway, getting back to yeah. Until Dawn, I just, I'm just really pleasantly surprised by it. Like, you know, I almost thought it was going to be like another The Order 1886. Like, I was going to be another toss-away game. I assumed it was going to be like four hours long. It's like at least double that. Um, Again, I don't know if I'd recommend buying it at full price because I have a feeling that it's not going to do great and and it may come down in price. Yeah, but you talking like that makes me not want to wait for it to drop. (laughs) I'm kind of, I'm I'm into it now. I'm curious now. That's the job of Game Face. You want to get you guys hyped (laughs) for good games. So... Again, I had really low expectations going in, and I came away more than pleasantly surprised. So if you guys love horror games, if you love story-based games, I highly recommend giving it a, a spin. At the very least, get it from Gamefly and, and give it a whirl. Because you honestly, that's probably the best thing you can do is get it from Gamefly, because mm-hmm. you can beat it easily in a couple days and then move on to the next one. So thumbs up for Until Dawn. I never really thought right. I would be saying that. Um, Who's the developer on that? I don't, I don't know, actually. I don't remember. I don't remember, remember. I don't no. remember either. But uh, whoever, whoever you is, are, good work. Props. Definitely a good job. All right, so let's move on to a controversy, man. All right. And this controversy, we've actually talked about this before you were the co-host. We've kind of mm-hmm. talked about YouTubers before on the show, and I make no bones about it that I, you know, I feel like you can't really trust YouTubers and that you know, people who are placing their faith in Let's Plays and YouTube videos on their, their purchase decisions, it's not a good idea. And I have more proof for my pudding now, Matt. So, uh, hit us. So hit us with it. There's this game called Dead Realm, and it's basically like a cheap jump scare game in the vein of like, like Five, Five Nights, Nights at Freddy's. Freddy's. Kind of yeah, thing, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And, and this game was actually developed. I'm so shocked there are clones of that starting. Yeah, to hit surprise, now. surprise. And to truth be told, this game is way better than Five Nights at Freddy's. It's actually a full-on, like, robust game. It's got, like, cooperative mul- or competitive multiplayer where one person plays mm. as a ghost and the other people play as, like, the humans and the ghost tries to scare the humans to death, blah, blah, blah. The game was developed by several YouTubers. In fact, you're seeing one of the developers on the screen right now. And basically what happened was this publisher came to them, and, or this developer came to them and said, hey, you know... We're not stupid. We, we see what's going on here. Like, there are certain types of games that are made to be played on Let's Plays on Twitch and then archived on YouTube, and we obviously want to tap into that market. So they hired three popular YouTubers with big subscriber bases to come in and basically tell them, what kind of game do you want us to make that you would want to stream and it would be successful? And so these three guys join up. They start working on this game with them. They design the game. The game gets finished. It's called Dead Realm. It comes out, and all of a sudden, these guys who are these YouTubers start doing Let's Plays of their own game. And, I mean, you can see just in this video his response to this game. Like, he is smiling the whole time. He's laughing. He's cracking stupid jokes. Basically, you know, giving the game as positive an impression as he he can. And this happened with the other two guys as well. They put up their Let's Plays. They do tons of views, blah, blah, blah. Here's the rub, though. These guys never disclosed to anyone that they were working on the game in their Mm. videos. And look, if you researched it, you could find it out. Like, if you actually Googled the game, you'd find out that, yes, these three YouTube guys 
helped develop it. It was kind of like the story of the game's development that they used to kind of market the game. But if you just stumble across this game or someone says, hey, there's this game like Five Nights at Freddy's called Dead Realm, and you go and watch their Let's Plays, and they're sitting there, they're very positive about the game, they seem to be having a blast while they're playing it, blah, blah, blah. There is no hint whatsoever that they have worked on this game. There is no disclosure. And there are laws in place by the FTC that say you have to divulge this. Even if you write a blog post about something that you have worked on or you have like a hidden agenda with, you ha- legally you have to disclose it. And so they did not do this. And the whole thing blew up, basically. And people started saying, hey, wait a minute. You guys worked on this game. You're not telling people that you worked on this game. You're just saying it's awesome. And there's you know, hundreds of thousands of people that have watched your Let's Play already that had no idea that this guy who's telling them to go out and buy the game and saying it's awesome actually has a conflict of interest with this game and shouldn't be doing that. So the damage, in a lot of ways, has already been done because the yeah. view, they've already been viewed 100,000 times or more, these videos, these Let's Plays. And so the developer and the publisher catch wind of what's going on with this, and they issue a statement yesterday. And Matt, the statement did not address any of the concerns that people had with the game. They never talk about disclosing that the people who worked on the game are doing these Let's Plays. They basically just said, we're getting a bad rap over nothing. And don't address it. And then today, when I was gathering footage for this segment for Game Face, I went to get those videos, and those videos are still not annotated mm-hmm. with disclaimers. And so, Matt, how, mu- how often do you think that this is happening that we're not knowing about? I don't know how not often necessarily that they worked they, on they the game. They were developers, but right. like in terms of being compensated in some way and not right. disclosing that, I would, as far as like the top level people, I would think that that happens pretty commonly. Um, the thing is, like when you're putting, you know, I think the let's play thing, you know, you at least get an idea of a game if you, you know, but, but you know, the, the it's always buyer beware. I, I, I say, you know, if you, no matter but how do you good think these kids, I mean, look, I, no matter look. how good a time someone's looking like they're having playing this game you got to evaluate the game separate from that. And the thing is, like, if you're putting your buying decisions in the hands of feedback from people who, you know, like, like YouTubers, like, they aren't journalists. They don't present themselves as journalists, and they don't have that same... Not well, some of them do. Some of them do, I guess, but, like, you're not really held to the same kind of... I hate to use the word for various reasons, but kind of the code of ethics that, like, a journalist would have or a reviewer or a critic would have in terms of, like, disclosure and... And sort of trying to, to trying to give to, to be on the side of the reader more than the side of the seller, and um, <laughs> that's the thing though they're not right. But I, <laughs> but I think you, but I think you give that up a little bit that assumption up a little bit when you move to something like this meet you know, the YouTube medium where like you don't know who these people are. And sure, I mean, but here's the thing, Matt. Sure, sure, they're like very you know outgoing and friendly, and it's like some, it's like someone you know, and it's like it's like hanging out in a chat with your buddies while one of them plays a video game. But like that's intentional. They're presenters. They're entertainers. Really, they're they're in cultivating that personality, cultivating that response they want you to have to them in that regard. So you'll subscribe and keep watching and make the money. Like that's what that's what the deal is. And so yeah, I think if you if you lift this particular rock up, I think you're going to find a lot of disgusting things under it. Yeah. And if the FTC really goes forward with something on this particular case, like I can see some really scary shit coming at, coming to light. Here's the thing: I don't think they ever will. I think you're probably right. And actually, as a tax-paying citizen of the United States of America, I really don't think they probably should spend all the money on investigating stuff like this. And truth be told, probably these people know it. They're yeah. like, "Are they really going to come after me over this?" Probably not. Why not? I mean, it is probably not a good use of resources. And, so. even, and even if you cared, it's like, if you open that can of worms, can you imagine the size of the job to be done oh, I know. on the part of... It's like, is it, you know, is it... I wonder if it's like, is it damaging or it's dangerous to the consumer enough that it's even worth doing? Because it's like, you know, can you watch this and really, you know, w- would this guy's enthusiasm... If you looked at this game and didn't like what you saw, would this guy's enthusiasm change your mind? I think if you didn't like it, no. I think if you were sitting on the fence about it, it would, though. Mm, that's possible. I think if you're sitting there saying, oh, I kind of like it, but I don't... Oh, this guy's having a blast playing mm. this game, and I've watched all his other Let's Plays, and, and you know, that's, that's where it starts to get dirty. It's because it gets dirtier, actually, 
if they're flip-flopping, if they're doing it sometimes and not doing it other times, because then you can build this level of trust with your viewers where, mm-hmm. well, you know what? The last five games he did less plays on, he said he, he liked this one, he didn't like this one, he liked this one, and I agree with him on all of those. And so you build this level of trust with your viewership so that whenever you do something like this, they just lap it right up. And to me, the other danger, I mean, let me ask you this, Matt. When was the last time you watched a Let's Play? Other than right now, watching this one. Um, I don't know, like two months ago? Two months. That's actually, I thought it would have been longer than that. I watched a Let's Play of Crusader Kings 2 because I didn't understand how to play that fucking game. Oh, like, so you use it as like a tool. I use it to understand to kind of how... I, well, first I watched... It was on sale on Steam, so I like. I think I like this game, but I'm not sure. So I watched a Let's Play where a guy kind of went through a basic game to kind of get a handle on whether it seemed like something I'd like. And I did decide it was something I'd like. And he was, you know, he wasn't like super enthusiastic. He was just like, "Here's how you do this." And yeah. I'm like, "That sounds cool." So I'm gonna get it. Did you like, end up liking it? I did like it. Good. I liked it a lot. But like, I had to watch a couple of videos to kind of get my head because tutorials are fine and all. But I had to get my head around kind of why I was doing stuff. And I find let's plays, um, you know, I don't watch the kind of the PewDiePie style let's plays where it's just people screaming or, yeah. or you know, that kind of thing. I like kind of the more youth oriented, shall we say? Yeah. Uh, but I like the let's plays that are like kind of people going through the game and kind of explaining why they're doing the you know the complicated yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'm not even in the same area as this, but I find them valuable in that. So still, it's been two months though since you watched one. Oh, wow. I haven't watched one other than for work on Sifted and years probably mm. like I just don't watch them and I don't really I mean I, but that's that, typical yeah. of our age range like people our age generally don't watch them people yeah, I got that kind of time I'm just gonna play something yeah I mean people in their 30s aren't watching let's plays the people who are watching the let's plays are the like five to like 15 to maybe even like early 20s the mm. people who are a little more gullible a little less street smart people who are more likely to fall for stuff like this and so these kids also I mean they've almost rejected traditional media almost out of like a weird principle that they have and Mm -hmm. i just feel like they're doing themselves a disservice by following these people like a charlatan when these people can be doing whatever they want and they have no one to answer to for it well i think it's it's an interesting phenomenon someone's going to write a really good dissertation about it one day about the the kind of fixation that that you know the youth of today kind of have on authenticity and how they've sort of embraced the YouTube Twitch thing as kind of the source of that authenticity when it comes to these kind of game interactions. But in truth, I think they've just traded one form of production for another. Yeah. And it's it's it to me it seems like more like you've just chosen a different way to be fooled. Yeah. You know, I mean I and Are you saying we're fooling people, Matt? As I'm, traditional journalists? I, Have you ever tried to fool somebody with a review you've done? Not to my knowledge. Maybe <laughs> maybe I fooled myself on a couple of them. But um, but it's it's you know. But I'm kind of thinking in the terms of like how they'd rather watch like, you know, let's say, a let's play than say a produced show about video games right. or something. Yeah. Just a total hypothetical show. Right. Yeah. Perhaps if somebody, anyone ever made a TV show about video games. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> if that were to ever happen. If that were to ever occur. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I think they, they, you know, they trust someone in a, in a computer chair with a webcam over someone standing on a stage with a, with a three-camera shoot. Yeah. And I, th- you know, as someone who has consumed media for many, many decades and, like, is skeptical about everything. Yeah, me Like, too. I just see a different set of artifice. Yeah. And if that's, if, and I, you know, if, if, if that's what you prefer your poison to be, cool. But I, I see a lot of people who seem to think one of these things is, is produced corporate bullshit and one of these things is real. Yeah. And I don't think the real is as real as they think it. I mean, it's, oh, it's definitely not as real as they think. It's like when people thought Survivor was real. Right. You know? like, yeah. It took a while for people to understand that reality shows are <laughs> just called scripted, that yeah. to differentiate them from the other scripted shows. Right. You know? like, they're still scripted, it's just a different Type way. Type of, of way, yeah. And, and again... There's an authenticity thing to that, where like, even if you know the Real Housewives isn't real, it feels real, and that might be mo- the most important part. And maybe that's kind of what's happening here with these YouTube personalities and such. Is like maybe maybe people don't care that they might be doing something like this. Maybe they just want that kind of production or that kind of entertainment, that kind of interaction, and that's what they value. Uh, look, that, I'm not and, looking, and at looking at it for truth. I'm not looking at it like. Is, is it good entertainment or bad entertainment? Right. I would never judge somebody based upon right. what kind of entertainment. Your question is, how many of these people 
are using this as a source of information. Right, and making thing. decisions based yeah. upon it. Not just, if they enjoy it, that's fine. Like, I have no mm. problem with that at all. But if, if those people are taking the information they're gleaning from these less plays and then formulating that mm. into their purchase decisions, that's where it starts to get... Well, here's, okay, here's a question for you that like, kind of maybe, maybe turns the other side of that. Like, what, what if someone's idea of the entertainment value of this game would be to stream it themselves on Twitch and be that let's player and they think that that well, you know what if what if that's part of the evaluation it's like oh this looks like fun to do a let's play on and, and people that follow my channel would enjoy this too so i'm going to do that well, that's a business decision that's a, there i got no yeah. problem with that but it's like <laughs> but it's, you know and it, that's just or, being smart but it, or if it's just you know it could just be a kid who has like you know his friends come into his chat you know there's there's plenty of twitch channels that have like 20 people in them yeah. 20 followers and it's right. just the same people every night yeah. they hang out they play games with each other and that's it and so you know I feel like some part of these decisions, you know, even if they are using them for information, some of these these buying decisions are so alien to me, as someone who's not part of that generation, that I, I'm I'm super hesitant to even judge that aspect of it because yeah. I I don't know I don't know what the data is I don't know how you would even get that data you know yeah. it's 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 uh, and I, I I feel for game makers and game publishers who are trying to like make major decisions based around how to find that market, and I just, I don't know how, where you even begin. Well, they just give money to PewDiePie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> That's what I should have done. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So, another big game that came out this week, again, Gears of War Ultimate Edition. Mm-hmm. I have also played that. I've only played the first few hours of it. Obviously, I played the original Gears 2 Death. Um, so I'm not going to play the game all the way through. I just wanted to give it a run to kind of see how much better it looked. And let me tell you, man, it looks a lot better, man. Yeah. And the one thing I would say about this game is that visually it holds up. And like mm-hmm. what they did with the original is something that still deserves commendation to this day. Because sure, they did some work on this. And you can watch all the like developer documents that they've done on it that show you what they've done on it. But... Watching those documents actually convinced me that what a great job they did with the original game because yeah. the art and everything was already there. And uh, obviously, they, they did all the creature design for this game. And, you know, so you can only do so much by up something. And so this is a game that undoubtedly is held up. And I've got to say that I was shocked at how well it did hold up because, you know, obviously there's been three gears and, like, every game has a cover system now and mm. every game is a stop-and-pop shooter and every thir- action-adventure game has shooting in it now and you just assume that there's been, you know, developers have found better ways to do it. And they really haven't. Like, Gears mm. of War is still kind of the, the gold indis- standard. It is still the gold standard for those type of games. And, you know, the... And you forget, I mean, Gears of War has also become, I think, kind of a punchline. Yeah. For the, for the dude bro. The dude bro thing. thing, yeah. And you forget, I mean, I thought uh, Cliff Lazinski doing, he did Gears Facts on Twitter yesterday. Yeah. And he he shared some real personal stuff in, in that. And you can see that... that you well, know, yeah, the, he said that the the original Mad World trailer yeah. was... They used that song because he had divorced his first wife, or they had gotten mm-hmm. divorced, and... And that was one of the songs he used to listen to. And he, he actually, I think he actually said, like, they happened to pitch that song to him. Yeah. As we thought this would fit. And that happened to be the song he was that listening to. That he was to when drowning he in a lot in, of this. Yeah. And he was just like, wow. And I think you can see, I mean, I like the Gears games in general, but I think the first one is extra special. Oh, and, sure. Of and, course, yeah. And I think, you know, especially reading all of his Gears Facts tweets yesterday, I think part of that is because... Like Cliff exercised some demons right. in that game. Like, yeah, there's, yeah, there's for sure. Some, there's some humanity in there that like you can feel. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's some feels in that game. Yeah. If people call it like dude bro or whatever, I don't. I don't really care what people call it. I enjoyed the crap out of Gears. I'm enjoying yeah. it again. But what this game has done is actually spurred on a topic for our show. I don't want to talk about Gears because we mm. talked about it almost a decade ago for, for <laughs> probably far too long on various shows that we've worked on. But what it did make me realize is that there are some games that end up standing up, standing the test of time, and there are some games that don't. So I thought it would be fun for both of us to kind of pick one, pick a game on each side. Mm. One game that we feel like is held up over time, and one game that we feel like is not held up over time. So let's get to the first one. I'm going to start a game for me that is held up truly the test of time, and this is an old one, is Final Fantasy Tactics. 
I have played that game all the way through four or five times at this point. I've never got sick of the game. I love the story in it. I love the combat in it. I love the strategic bent to the Final Fantasy franchise, which you really haven't gotten since. Um, and look, it's a little bit of cheating, because one thing I would say is that strategy games in general tend to hold up because they're turn-based, and as long as you've got a decent story there. Yeah, and but presentationally, I'm, I'll full disclosure, I'm not much of a Final Fantasy Tactics fan. Uh-oh. But, <laughs> um, I do like the story, and I think it has some of the best music of its generation. And presentationally, I think it was one of the first strategy, you know, turn-based strategy games, at least on consoles, to really... You know, say like, there's no reason that this genre can't, you know, be as top level, top notch presentation as any other game genre, and they just went for broke with it, and I think that's why one of the reasons it still looks good and it still sounds good. Now, what are your quibbles with it, Matt? I, I must I, know because I, I, I have to say, you are one of the only people I've ever met who's yeah, into games that does not love Final Fantasy Tactics. I, I, part of it might have been just where I was at the time, but I gotta say, I'm a I'm a shining force, you know, te- you know, in terms of turn-based RPGs. I'm a Shining Force guy, uh-huh. and I like, you know, Fire Emblem a lot and all that. And fa- Tactics, just when I played it, had this thing where I just it drove me nuts in how little it would communicate to the player and how you had to commit to your move before you could see what your attack range was, and then sometimes your attack range wasn't what you thought it would be because it, it has that verticality system in it. So it's like, oh, sorry, you're like half a millimeter too high to hit that guy with your sword because you, you're, he's too far below you. Or the spell won't reach him, or whatever. Yeah, and, but I and mean, it just learned, drove me. You cool. learn the range and all that like really quickly, like somewhat. But I just, it, I, it, it felt like it was fighting me. And that game's hard enough. It like, is hard. Like that game is really challenging. It is, and, yeah. You, you know, it's it's tough. You know, and and it just wasn't where I wanted to. Be. I I guess maybe I wasn't where I wanted to be. I did like the tactics advanced games on the GBA, yeah. and later I just that that game, except for the story, which I think is. Probably Square's best story of the PS1 generation, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Uh, and one of, I mean, the music in that. Listen, listen to the the screechy MIDI of Final Fantasy VII, and then jump to the music that was in Tactics. Yeah. And how far did they come? Oh I yeah, mean, in a very the short composition of, time. of VII is great, but just the actual instrumentation, the sound quality, is, yeah. the sound quality is incredible on that game. And you know, same on the PSP. I don't know how much you played it. War of the Lions. I don't know. That was my fourth playthrough, yeah. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I'm not going to... I don't disparage anyone who liked that game or loves that game, but it just didn't do it for me. It's a total time killer, man. You Mm -hmm. take that game on a flight over the Pacific or flying to Europe, and man, lickety-split, your butt is landing on the runway, and and you've only made about four hours of progress through the game. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Matt, so what is your game that you feel like has stood the test of time? My hold-up game is um, Knights of the Old Republic 2, Star Wars. Now, see, I will agree that that is a great game. Yeah. That is which I've been stood playing, the test of time. You know, since they did that big update, I mean, it helps that they just updated it with the widescreen and stuff, but really, uh, the changes in that were just to make easier things that the, fan, you know, the community had already made possible with mods. And so I'm, pl- I'm playing it again. And it really is impressive to me how like I've got a sh- I got the shader mod in there, so the, it's got bloom and some modern lighting stuff. So well, it's at least the flat. 4K version of the yeah. game. <laughs> but it's like, but the, like there's the shader mod makes it so it's not quite as flat lit, right? You know, right. So it looks a little more. But but I'm like the writing is still there. The exploration of what the force could be and could not be is there in a way that like no other real story in Star Wars has ever explored. The characters are still. I mean, it's just it's it's a you know it's obsidian. It's, it's, it's not a pretty it. game. Not a pretty game. Yeah, visually, it is not you're, really you're really the test of time. You're really never coming to the the Bioware style RPGs for the pretty. Yeah, you know, even back then. Yeah, um, and just it's it still kind of transports you to this like other version of Star Wars that I'm really hoping you know they've got. See, the- that was the one thing I didn't like about it. I didn't like about either Kotor. And look, this is just nitpicking because I otherwise I loved both of those games, but I didn't like that it kind of strayed off into this other like. Star Wars universe that I had no connection or like relation mm. to. Like, well, that's the thing about that. It was like, I was that, always praying that like Luke Skywalker would walk in and like you know I knew 3, it wasn't three thirty eight hundred years later. I know I knew it wasn't gonna happen. That's the, one of the only rules in Star Wars is there's no time travel. Oh really? You ever think you ever notice that? Well, other than no one you mentioned travel. earlier, which is Darth Vader can't run. He never runs. You've never seen Darth Vader run, right? Um. Did he, no, in Battlefront 2, he just glides. He slides, yeah. He slides. <laughs> um, 
because Darth Vader stalks. That's what right, he does. Right, that's what he does. He wouldn't be scary if he but ran. They, but uh, no time travel in uh, in Star Wars, as uh, as far as I can remember. Maybe maybe some horrible expanded universe novel. But somewhere. Matt, there's so many elements of the Force we can only pretend to understand. <laughs> <laughs> They could have done it, but they knew yeah. better than to bring. You know, actually, no, I guess uh, there was some. Kind I'm of sure Lucas Arts was like, nah, no way in hell. There was a crossover called Vector, where they kind of had a little time travel. Yeah, but uh, I digress. But um, Knights of the Republic, I think, is one of the most you know interesting explorations between the two games, and especially the second game. It of, was probably the best action RPG of that era, for sure. I would say. And I'm interested to see. I know the the new expansion for Old Republic, the MMO, is coming up, and they said that it's Knights of the Fallen. Something and <laughs> and uh, I don't it's I don't remember. Uh, well, it's just weird that they have like, they, they Knights said, of the Old Republic and then just the Old Republic. Right. I mean, they well, probably could have done a better job. Yeah. You don't want to give people the impression that it's Kotor three. Right. 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 But the new expansion is supposed to be very story oriented and more like a classic kind of Bioware sort of thing. So I'm interested to see if they can. Think we'll ever see another Kotor? Bit. No. Yeah, I don't either, man. No. I, I hate think to say the it. closest we're going to get is this expansion that's coming up, I think. And, I don't uh, know, man. I could actually, now that EA has that license, I could actually see an action do you RPG. Do th- you think they, w- they might like kind of go to maybe even Bioware and be like, hey, I mean, we do this they're again, already working with them. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I Bioware has actually mentioned offhand a couple. Don't times. let me stop you. I mean, you know, <laughs> go for it. I, I, I will play that forever. But... People still ask him about it. Like, will there yeah. be another Kotor? And I think I saw an interview with one of the guys at Bioware from a few months ago, where he said, "Well, we still talk about it around the office." Yeah. So, dude, imagine that. Would that yeah. not bring the roof down at next year's E3 if they announced Kotor three? That would be. I mean. Man, that's your, that's, that's, that's your Shenmue 3 of yeah, yeah. Next E3 of if next you do E3, that. Yeah, it's, for sure. I don't know. I, I, I would love to see it, but I don't want to think about it too much because it's just going to make me sad if it doesn't ever yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah. But like, um, you know, KOTOR with modern graphics and modern, you know, what they've learned from like, you know, the Mass Effects and all that. Think I, about that it. would be incredible. It would be. The Witcher, like a KOTOR, like of the, the oh, quality of The Witcher me. 3. <laughs> Killing me over here. All right, let's move on to the <laughs> to some games that have not held up quite as well. I think my first one might raise some ire among okay. game people. It's certainly been a hot topic recently, and it's been a game that I've seen a lot of people give a lot of praise to over the last few months. And my game is Shenmue. Mm. That why don't you, game. Why don't you unpack that for us a little bit. Well, I mean, you can unpack it by <laughs> just by watching this footage that's playing right now. It is just. Here's the thing. When that game came out, uh, here's a little anecdote for you. So I was working at GameSpot when this game came out. And I was playing the game. I was very fortunate that Sega gave me a copy for review at the same time that they gave the copy to the guy who was actually reviewing it for GameSpot, who is a guy named Frank Provo. And uh, we were all playing it in the office. Sega hooked us all up with copies of the game. Because it was like the game for the Dreamcast. It Mm. was like... It's like the, the way people are waiting for Zelda for the Wii U right now is the way people were waiting for Shenmue yep. for Dreamcast whenever it, it had just first launched. That was the marquee game that everybody was waiting for. And so everybody at the office, no matter whether they were reviewing other games like I was, we were all still playing it. And so because we were all reviewing other games, Frank Provo got to blaze through the game and finish the game way before everybody else. And his review came in, and his review was a 6.8. Yep, I remember that. And I remember when... Jeff Gersman was the reviews editor at that time, and he came out and basically asked everybody in the office, they're like, hey, Frank's score just came in for Shenmue. I know you guys are all playing it. The score is a 6.8. And I remember, myself included, everybody was like, oh, my God, he's insane. <laughs> he, he's not playing the same game. What's wrong with him? And it's like this huge uproar with the staffers at GameSpot because Frank was a freelancer. Don't ask me why a freelancer tackled Shenmue. I, <laughs> I still don't understand to this day how that happened. But the whole office went crazy, saying he's crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. The review went up. People went berserk. <laughs> I mean, you've never seen Fanboy Fuhrer like you saw when that review went up for Shenmue. I mean, it was just... I mean, back then, Sega had freaking fanboys, dude. I mean, oh, yeah. honestly... I, I was would, one of them. Honestly, I would say... The Sega fanboys from that era were the most rabid fanboys I have ever encountered in my life. Because the because their 
company was dying. Yeah. I mean, they were insane. And I mean, it was like, if they had online petitions back then, it would have had like a mil- It actually would have yeah. done something, unlike today. <laughs> <laughs> and so, look, I and I still, it, probably for a good year or two after that, a, thought my opinion was the same. Like, it was an amazing game, and he was insane, and he was wrong, and blah, blah, blah. But now... I see the wisdom of Frank Provo's <laughs> ways. And here's the thing. When Shenmue came out, it was like really the first kind of open world action adventure, triple A game. I mean, there had been like Body Harvest on the N64, but that game was all kinds of full of jank. And there had been a couple other examples of it, but it was like the first like really polished, big budget, open world action adventure. And so I think I was mesmerized by that. And so... Now I go to play that game, man, and I cannot make it past like the first like hour and a half or two hours mm-hmm. of the game. And look, I've seen a lot of jur- with the whole Shenmue three thing recently. I've seen a lot of journalists gushing over the Shenmue games, and I just got to say they're insane, dude. Like, well, insane. Well, let me give you some background in the sense that I was I, you know, I grew up with Sega. I was a Sega fan growing up, and I had the Dreamcast. I had a Japanese one. I had an American one. And when Shen- Shenmue came out, I bought the limited edition of the Japanese one, and I played through it in Japanese with the help of a fact from Game Facts. <laughs> Does Game uh, Facts still exist? Yeah, by it's the still way? there. It's still there. I just wonder if it survives with all the. Not work. as common, but I still go there because, as an old man, I don't want to watch your damn video. That's what I'm saying. About with, for five minutes to get to the one thing I need to know. With all the Let's Plays today, yeah. it's like, does Game Facts even matter anymore? Yeah, some there's some old people that still seem to do them. But, yeah. So I got that. I bought the U.S. version, limited edition. I have a sealed copy of Shenmue Jukebox. I have every single version of Shenmue 2 put out. Xbox, European Dreamcast version with the English subtitles, Japanese version, which I played through. I have, um, I have the Shenmue 2 Xbox reissue movie poster framed, signed by Yu Suzuki <laughs> on my wall in my living room. Wow. And I agree with you. Oh, Wow. <laughs> Because I played them again uh, earlier this year, I, I bought uh, like a VGA box and a converter, an HDMI converter, and everything for this for the Dreamcast. And yeah. I was like, I'm gonna play some fucking Shenmue. Yeah. And this was before E3. Like, I didn't even know the Shenmue three right, was coming. Right. So I played through most of Shenmue one. You until, made it the until, whole way through. Well, well maybe I, I'm saying sixty percent, maybe. That's but still like, impressive. That's as far as I could go, and it was just that you know I, I wanted it to get to the sailor part. Right. The sailors, yeah. by the way, we invented that as far as yeah, I, as far yeah. as I remember. <laughs> extended play. Greg Bemis put that original sailor montage together in the, in the yep. review of that game, and I know that's a running gag now, but like I just want to say we started that. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. You never get credit for memes in this world. No, no, <laughs> but um, the uh, but but to me like you know it's. It was so hard to learn how to play it again, and like you know, just holding the trigger to run, and then like kind of trying to maneuver him with the D-pad and trying to get him to agree that what I was trying to look at was actually what I was trying to look yeah, at. Yeah. And then you finally get him to look at something, and he just like picks the orange up and puts it down. You're yeah. like, oh, I wanted to do. I thought you wanted to do. Ah, ah yeah. And like it just—it's so frustrating, and man. Like the, and you get out to the thing, and here's the thing that bothered me about with, during this playthrough: it, what happens to the kitten? Yeah, yeah. What like, did happen to the kitten? Like, I've never found like an ending to that kitten story. Like, I don't know what the closure is on the kitten thing. I think it like disappears, and maybe maybe one of the kids takes it at some point or something. But I don't, I don't know. Like, what happens to the kitten? Like, if they Shen- hit, if they hit ten million, maybe they'll give. Yeah, you the, Shenmue the... Three needs to give me some closure on the kitten story. I need to know that cat went to a good home and grew up well and and lived a long, happy lived life. Lived on a because, farm and hunted mice. Because at this life. like this year, all I could do was just keep stealing dried fish from the temple shrine to give it to the cat. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm just like, I don't know if this is doing any good. But like. Yeah, so I need some closure on the kitten, folks. Like this is this is my request to the Shenmue Three developers. But I think you're right. If they, you know, the rumor is that like there's been there's a HD Shenmue One and Two like re- remaster that Sega's basically had ready to go for a long time. Really? And we might hear. I something. have not heard that. I've there's been rumors the Shenmue Shenmue community uh, will grasp at any straw right. you, you hand their way. So that has been a, a persistent rumor. Uh, there are people wondering if they might say something to TGS. Um, now that Shenmue 3 is obviously a thing, Sega, pro- I, if I were Sega, I want to get in on that. Action, yeah, for right? sure, yeah. Um, so maybe. But like, all I can say is if you're going to do HD remasters of that game, 
uh, you better revamp that control system in a way because like, it's just going to turn everybody off the Shenmue yeah. three. Well, just like you know, I ran into the same <laughs> thing with uh, Jet Force Gemini in the yeah, yeah. replay, where I'm just like, I love that, I love that game, and yeah. I couldn't play it. And yeah. like, they actually put a patch out that like allows you to to use like dual stick normal dual stick controls like the way we expect today, because that game predates dual analog control in that. Well, regard. yeah, you strafed with the C buttons, like yeah, you had sixty four C buttons, and then like. You know, that was how the N64 worked. Then you went to the aiming, and you aimed with the same stick you moved with, yeah. and we just don't do that anymore. Like, my thumbs don't understand that anymore. Well, I remember the final boss in that game, Mizar, which is one of the most difficult boss oh, fights sure. that I've ever completed. Like, I actually beat Mizar and finished the game. I remember I had to play that game like... Um, like no, I always play like this. And you see, like, old people, they'll put their hands like <laughs> this. Or some people, when they play fighting games, they'll yeah. turn their hand like that, which I totally get. I actually play fighting games like that, too. Every other game I play like this, that boss, I had to play like this. I had these two fingers on the strafe, and then the top yellow button made you was a jump. Mm-hmm. And so there's parts in that boss fight where there's like a, an electric cord that you have to like jump rope, basically. And then you have to strafe side to side to avoid asteroids. And so I had to play it like this to beat the boss. Like, mm-hmm. I totally get where you're coming from. That's and crazy. I also agree with you with... Shenmue, it's the same way. Like, the game, the controls need to be revamped. But there's, it goes so far beyond that with Shenmue. Yeah. Well, it's also, not... like, Shenmue 3 needs... I mean, I hope they're not planning on trying to keep continuity with the controls for Shenmue 3. No, they can't, dude. There's no way. There's I, no way. Right, right. 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 <laughs> they can't. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just put a cap on this. One thing I would say is it's been... Th- in thinking about this topic, it was very interesting how some genres hold up better than others. Like I said, strategy games. It's easier for them to have longevity. The open world action adventure, like the, like Body Harvest. Like, did you ever play that game? Oh, I love Body Harvest. Like, but you wouldn't love it now. No, it's very hard to play now. It was <laughs> yeah. hard to play then. It was, really. man. I mean, that was a fog. brutal game, yeah. I mean, that, was, that was in the days of the N64 where like, everything was like, you just compared fog, like, terminal zones. And, like, you know, sh- like, Turok was the champ, I think, until, yeah, until yeah. Body Harvest came along. Well, here's the thing about Body Harvest, too, is that, like, I would play a remastered body har- like a modern body harvest in a, in a split second. But it was broken. Would... The game was so yeah. broken. Like, you get in a plane, you start flying, and you'd end up in the middle of nowhere and crash, and you had no recourse. No way out. No <laughs> way but out. If you, if you flew that B-17 yeah. the right way, right. you could kill the boss of the whole area yeah, like, with yeah. one bombing you're right. run, you're right. as opposed to like a 40-minute boss battle with your stupid pistol. Yeah, you're right. So like there was a reward to it, but like that game, and there's no saving. It was no, brutal, you know, dude. It was, just, it was, it was so a, hard. I never finished it. I got to the Siberia. I never finished it either. I got to the Siberia one, which I think the third area or the fourth area, and like... I flew a MiG, and that was the end of my I've day. never seen the end of that game, the you ending mean, of it. Maybe I should go... I'm sure it's... A, maybe there's a Let's Play. There might be. <laughs> I want to watch somebody Let's Play through that sucker. <laughs> All right, let's go to your game that does not hold up for I you. doesn't hold up. Brings us back to Rare Replay again, where I've been playing a lot of that. It's a great collection. But I decided finally, now that the Infinite Life option is there... Uh, I'm gonna finish Battletoads. Oh God! And um, fuck that game. Like, <laughs> like I, I mean, I, my friend Rob and I rented it. Uh, he rented it for his Nintendo when it came out back when we were kids. And we, I mean, I think we got like everyone else. We got to the jet bike level and just couldn't get anywhere. Yeah. And then I think I continued stealing one of his lives, and we got in a fight over that, and that was the end of it. Yeah. But like, I, you know, now with Infinite Lives, even that game is unfair, and it's like. The constant. Think back to when you didn't have infinite lives oh, yeah. playing that we game. You just had three lives, and it's like, oh, you got to this boss. Oh, he can one shot you from off screen with like this, yeah. or like this one. <laughs> oh, like you know, going down the the pit with with on the on the on the, yeah. on the bungee line thing or whatever. Like, oh, if you let that crow go too far, he'll just cut your line and you die. Yeah, and it's just like. <laughs> <laughs> and like Infinite Lives is really the only mod- moderately fair way to play that game, and like yeah. it's just it is just trial and error the game over and over, and it's so it I felt like it was it's the closest I felt since I was a child to being bullied. It's masochistic. The it game. is, yeah. And I felt like somewhere in the in the depths of time in the in eight in the eight somewhere in the eighties. Some sadistic rare developer is just laughing at me. Oh, yeah. Still, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's just, I just felt like I was in this weird temporal battle with this sadistic jerk who designed some of this stuff. Here's my question for you, though: If it weren't so cheap and filled with trial and error and so difficult, would it still be a good game? 
in terms of like, I mean, I love beat 'em ups. I love like the Streets of Rage style thing and like the Ninja Turtles arcade game and all that stuff. Like, I'm really a big fan of that kind of thing. And I think Battletoads is like one nice person away from being a really good beat 'em up from that era. I think it would it really because when it's just you fighting like guys and like doing the big boot thing and ramming them with the horns, yeah. and stuff, like it's great. It's fun, and yeah. And there's a little, you know, like that first boss, like it's suddenly done from the first person perspective, and you're throwing the rocks at him. It's like there's really great ideas and creativity in that game, yeah. and it's all ruined by the fact that it hates you so much, it, and it's just, <laughs> and you hate it, and I hate it right back. And I don't know if I'm gonna actually get through. I'm about halfway through it, but I don't know. If I'm ever gonna actually with infinite through. lives with infinite lives because it's some point because it's all checkpointed so like yeah even even though you have infinite lives you still got to get through that jet bike stuff oh for sure yeah, you, got, you, you have gotta, to, you gotta get through it, it. Yeah. yeah and at one point I mean you know there's the, the end of the jet bike the first jet bike section you got to like you know fast maneuver up and down through like continue I think it's like almost like eighteen like fifteen or fifteen or sixteen at least. Walls, just top, bottom, top, bottom, bottom. Yep. And at one point, I'm like, I don't know if the Xbox One's D-pad is fast enough yeah. <laughs> to let me do this. And, and it just, and I ended up having to count in my head, like, just like, oh, one, two, one, two. I, I counted a rhythm out to it and just didn't even, I look at the didn't screen. look at the screen. I just did it and I, and I made it. And I was like, and then, and then there's like one more, there's like one more thing you can hit at the end of that. And it hit. And I, get, oh. and I had to do it again. And I'm just like, and it's like, you can see moments in that game where it's like, they place the one hit kill thing right where they know you're gonna go. Oh yeah, and it's, and it's, it's this. The or most... right at the end of a sequence. Oh, yeah. well, you can where they you knew can it would break your heart. Thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's and so like I'm you know I know there's a place for that kind of design. Is there? But it's not in my house. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think that's a good pick. Although I would say I don't know if a lot of people do view it as like a great game. I think it's just more heralded because of how hard it was and how impossible Somewhat. it was. I think there are definitely people that, that you know love it and still loved it and still love it. And there are people that speed run it. Oh yeah, <laughs> just as far as I'm insane. concerned, that's where it can stay. I'll yeah, just watch. Yeah. I'll watch it on Games Done Quick uh, when they do it, and like that's as once I get through this thing, so I can unlock the stupid rare. Video because right. I want to see the videos. That's right, I, right. I want to collect all these stamps so I can see the videos. Yeah, like, uh, it's yeah, it's it's really demoralizing. It is demoralizing because there's, there's sometimes you get those old games where you're like, oh, I played this as a kid and it was so hard, and, was, and now you're an adult and you've played decades more and like you're very experienced and you can figure out how things where you can kind of get your mind around stuff. And it's like, yeah. oh, I figure this is easy. This is cool. Yeah. And like now it's with Battletoads, it doesn't, didn't get any better. There, I, I think there are still a lot of old games that are really hard though. Oh, the, I mean the first, the first like 10 games on Rare Replay are borderline masochistic in, yeah. in themselves. I mean, that's, what was it? The second was Solar, not Solar Jet, man. It's the second game in the collection where Jet it's like. Jetpack? Not Jetpack. It's the one after that where you're like, there's like the rover and you have to drive the bomb to like the alien base and blow it up I like know. i couldn't get the rover to move for like <laughs> t- i couldn't figure out how to play it it was like it, i mean it, it was like playing one of those old like 2e games i'd get and like and, and i'm just like wait what's the but i don't understand oh, I'm dead. how this works oh, okay, <laughs> oh i'm dead. dead oh that's a snake okay i don't know you know like it's like this like weird sort of like modern art interpretation of things that hurt yeah. you and, and, I, and like the early rare stuff doesn't even try so like here's a flashing light that's like a it, it's an asteroid it yeah, kills you <laughs> fuck you and it's like this don't let it touch you. Use your gun. You know? and, and it's like, oh, but there's 4,000 of them. They never stop coming. And every time, the fun, it's the, I wish I could remember the name of it, but it's like, if you, it's, if you, it might be Lunar Jet, man. I don't know. But if you get hit and you, you fly, like you don't just die, you fly and you hit the ground. And when you hit the ground, you cause a crater. And if you cause a crater by the rover, the rover can't drive over the yeah. crater. So you have to get a little bridge thing from the, from the rover and put it down on the crater and ev- so it could drive over and every single time I'd finally br- bridge the gap I would then be hit again and land right on the bridge yeah. and have to do it again <laughs> so it's 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 a time that you wonder why it's long games- since passed and for good reason yeah you wonder, you wonder why games didn't get to be mainstream until this century there's why yep <laughs> all right that will do it for our topics of games that have have held their their own over the years our last topic of the big six, I think this one's going to generate some great conversation because it's really no black and white to it. So this past week, Tim Schafer and a gaggle of other industry luminaries, I guess for lack of a better, yeah, better term, and... yeah, some, some big players in the industry basically got together and decided to create a competitor 
for Kickstarter, but it, there's a twist to it. And the twist is, is that the people who invest in the games, and it's also 100% games, whereas Kickstarter does a bunch of other things. This is called Fig, and it's just for video games. And so the twist to it is that if you invest in a game, you back a game, and it does well, you actually have the opportunity to get residual income from the success of that game. So essentially, you're investing in the game, and then if the game does well, you can actually make money off of it. What I call it, Matt, is it's like a stock market for indie games. Yeah. I mean, that's really what you're doing, right? Yeah. Is you're saying, oh, I'm gonna invest X amount of dollars in this. If it does well, I'll actually get a return on my investment. I guess the the good comparison, or the, 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 the better comparison when comparing it to the stock market is you never really lose like you do with the stock market. Like, right. You'd assume in most cases you're at least going to get the game that you've invested in. So one of the caveats has really raised a lot of ire with this is that not just anybody can invest in the games. You have to be, quote unquote, like a certified investor. Like you have to be legally considered an investor before you're allowed to invest in these games. And so a lot of outlets did editorials about this and railed on it. I believe Polygon did one that was pretty scathing and really went off and said, you know, there's all kinds of hidden things here that people aren't thinking about and this isn't going to work. And then yesterday or the day before, one of the co-founders of Devolver Digital wrote an editorial for a website and basically said, you know, that guy who said that doesn't know what he's talking about. This is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. So there's been this conflict going on between mm -hmm. sort of these two sides. Matt, which side do you fall on? I think it's a really cool idea. Um, like it makes sense, and especially in terms of if you can, you know, the, 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 the like you said, the, the what do you call it, the, the approved investors or the, yeah. the verified investors, like that makes sense to me because you, you know, you, you need to have some checks and balances on that. But in terms of taking the Kickstarter, the crowdfunding idea to the next level, like this seems like a pretty logical step. Okay, look, by the way, Kickstarter has already come out and said it is not going to adjust its model for this. Mm -hmm. it, it, I, I don't think they, it should. Well, I they think... say that now, but I have a feeling if Fig takes off and suddenly all that video game money is going to Fig and Kickstarter is missing out on it, mm -hmm. I have a feeling they might change their stance a little it's bit. A big if, but like you know, because like the thing about the Fig is like I wouldn't even know where to begin, like legally double checking. You know, and sounds like. From the Devolver Digital guys, like you know, his his editorial and like all, you know, it sounds like they have thought of a lot of this. Yeah. Um, oh, for sure. But it's just you know, like like they say, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy, and uh, I I gotta wonder what's gonna happen that first day they open those gates. Yeah, I mean, you start looking at some of these games that we're showing right now. They're like, or when games, like, when someone invests in games and they don't make money. Right. You know? I mean, you have people you're not understanding quite what the idea of a Kickstarter donation really means in the sense of like... Well, people, it, yeah, now are like... Yeah, I mean, you're throwing money in a <laughs> hole and hopefully a game comes out of it two years later. Pretty much, yeah. It. And when it comes to this, it's like you're not guaranteed to make your money back. Well, I mean, I think you're still assuming you're going to get the game for free. Yeah, yeah, you would hope. And that's real. I think at this point, that's all most people who crowdfund are hoping for, is that they, oh, get, right, they get the product that they feel like they paid in advance for. And at the same time, you know, emotionally, that gets, it's a little bit rewarding to know that, you know, something you contributed to created something where there would be nothing before. I think that's part of the draw of Shenmue 3, in fact, is that a lot of people feel like this game was never going to get made. And now I feel empowered knowing that something I did uh, made a difference. And now this game is going to get made. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you start thinking about it, start thinking about some of these more successful Kickstarter games like Project Cars, like that game is sold through the freaking roof. Imagine if you had, quote unquote, invested in Project Cars and yeah. it goes on to sell like three or four million. I mean, look, like you could make some real money off of this. Move Shenmue 3 to Fig. Like, and here's the other thing that I think is really good about this. Imagine if you back Star Citizen on Fig. Right, yeah, I mean. We'd all be retired. <laughs> You're right, we'd all be retired. <laughs> it hasn't even come out yet. No, we'd all just be in Aruba and it wouldn't matter. Here's what I really like. <laughs> of, yeah, you're right. <laughs> we wouldn't be sitting here, that's for damn sure. Here's what I really like about it, though, is that because the opportunity is there to make money off of this, that I feel like people will research the projects much more intensely. Mm -hmm. It's not going to just be like, oh, I'm just going to throw $5 at this guy or $10 or $50 at this guy or whatever. 
When you know there's the opportunity for you to actually get a return on your investment, you're going to do your due diligence and you're going to investigate the developers of these games. What have they worked on before? What's their track record? Do they usually deliver games on time? I mean, it, it also, so it incentivizes you to be a smarter investor and, and spend your money more wisely. It's also going to weed out all the crackpot like Kickstarter people. Yeah, you're not. You're probably not going to find the kid who wants to make a sequel to Bubsy. Because you know, here, well, man, not yeah. even just that. Not even just the people who start a Kickstarter that is for a project that's never going to work. But just but you pe- have to have a pedigree, right? It's going to also get rid of the people who are just doing it to try to scam people, yeah. to try to make money and never make the product because they know that the people who would potentially fund their product are going to investigate them first and see if they've ever done anything of note, and so. I feel like on both sides of the equation, well, there's now a third side of the equation when you're talking about FIG, obviously, but Mm -hmm. both sides of the equation here, the consumers, us, the people who want to invest in these products, better for us, we're getting money, it's going to incentivize us to actually do our research before we invest in it. And you have the developers who all the crackpots and the the scammers are going to get weeded out. And so, you know, the developers know that once they put their product up on FIG, people are going to assume that they're legit and that they have a higher probability Mm -hmm. of actually getting a Turn on their investment, and maybe even a big return on their investment. So, to me, I really have a problem like seeing any negative in this. Like, I've even thought about like Red Ash. Like, would that go different if it was Fig? You know, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, like, there's a lot of ground from here to there. But it, like look, the idea it, of that becoming kind of the next way people get involved, and it almost makes sense for gaming in the sense of making it a more interactive and a more rewarding thing for the people who want to invest in gaming because I think a lot of the people who really, you know, jump in on these Kickstarters, I think the people who jumped in on the Shenmue 3 Kickstarter are in there because they love it, they love the the medium, and I think, you know, I think people, they love Shenmue and they want other people to experience it and and to spread that word and they want, same thing with the the people who backed Iga's Kickstarter for Bloodstained, for, you know, the Castlevania fans who just don't want that to end. And... Like, why not? Like, why not make them part of the success beyond just getting a game they wanted? Why not do that? If, if they've figured this out, if they've figured out how to do this with an airtight legal system, with a legal team that must rival Disney's at this point, like, yeah. I mean, you're going to have to have that. But, like, if they figure it out, like, I say more power to them. I say change, change it. Change the game. Change what indie games are. I mean, that could, that could be everything. Here's the other thing I would say, too, is that crowdfunding is already heading in this direction because we're seeing it. We saw it with Red Ash where they didn't hit their goal, but they already had these investors waiting in the wings who were going to swoop in and give them the rest of the money that they needed to finish the game. We saw it with Shenmue. Mm -hmm. You can't make Shenmue with six or eight million dollars or however much they raised. Like it's going to cost way more than that, but it showed other investors that, hey, there is an interest in this and maybe it's worth me putting my money into it. And now you're just kind of formalizing that process and making it more transparent because mm-hmm. a lot of people felt like the way Red Ash and Shimu 3 was handled was a little shady. They felt like there was some subterfuge going on there, even though for the most part there was full disclosure, at least for Shemu 3, it seemed like. Although we didn't know how much Sony was involved at first. It takes all of that gray area out of it and just says, look, this guy invested 10 grand in this game. You invested $50 in this game. Like, <laughs> you kind of know where you stand, you know where the project stands, you know who has most skin, the most skin in the game. Um, I don't know, man. It just seems like the perfect system to me. And it, minus the fact that I don't I honestly don't feel like you should be an accredited investor to be able to invest in this. And I feel like that could be its downfall. There may be some legal reason. I'm not a lawyer, obviously. I've never been to law school. I have a couple you know of friends they, who are lawyers, but... Like, do you know how they determine that? I don't know how or why they determine that. I mean, mm-hmm. honestly, I mean, I'm sure there's some legal thing in, in there where they're like, well, if you're going to give someone a kickback for something they invest in, they need to be... It's just like, you can't just wake up one morning and say, I want to buy stocks. Right. Like, you, you can't do it. Like, you, you can't just, like, go to a website <laughs> called stockmarket.com. Especially not this morning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's been brutal. <laughs> And put in your credit card and say, I'm buying $20 of Apple. Like, it doesn't work that way. Like, there's a process that you have to go through and a vetting that you have to go through. Not Bitcoins. Right. But look, I didn't have to take a class to be able to buy stocks. I didn't have to get a license or take a test or anything to to be able to buy stocks. Like, I had to go through a vetting process. And once I got through that, I can buy and sell stocks however I want to. And so, for me, for them to, like, 
lock that feature off in Fig when we're basically just talking about like investing in video games, trying to get them made. That just seems insane to me. Like, I don't know. I mean, I I have to think because you know, gaming communities don't generally like things that are locked away, yeah. particularly when they're locked away behind paywalls. Right. But um, to me, that. I don't have. I am also not a lawyer, but like I feel like there must have be a reason. There has for to that. be because there we're talking about Tim Schafer here. Tim yeah. Schafer has his finger on the pulse. He's had successful Kickstarters before. All these guys have. They have, yeah. Which is why they. It's a smart team that they put together. They know the ins yeah. and outs of it. Which again, lending credence to what you just said, you're probably right. There's just a reason that they had to do it this way legally. Mm-hmm. But I also feel like it could make it really difficult for them to get enough funding for a lot of the games. It could, I mean, it depends how, high, how, does that, it how high that bar is, basically. I mean, it happens from... The, the fans make it happen, man. Like, yeah. there's a couple whales that come in into these things and maybe drop down 10 grand or whatever. For the most part, it's people like you and I going in there and putting down 60 bucks at a time. Yeah. Like, it's... <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's, maybe, maybe you're lucky if there's 10 $10,000 donations. Right. There's like 9000 To know, get 50 or whatever, or yeah. Yeah, so... And that's where the, you know, yeah, the five-figure donations are the most impressive when they you know, make that total jump on the final, like, 12 hours of the game. But it's those thousands and thousands of people that threw in a, 20, a $20 bill that make up the bulk of that fund. They make up the bulk of it. They also are the ones who create the social media momentum yeah. for the project. And that's what you can't discount. And so if you're closing it off to these people who go on Twitter and Facebook and say, oh my God, Shenmue 3, holy crap. Like, mm-hmm. if you're cutting those people out, you've lost all your free marketing for that Kickstarter or whatever they're going to call it, a fig starter. I wonder what they will call their their program. But oh. maybe let's call it a fig. But uh, I don't know. I'm excited about it, but I feel like the one issue I have with it could be like the deal breaker. It could be. I mean, I, I think it depends how hard it is to become... A confirmed or accredited investor. I mean, maybe it's nothing more than just like you know, making sure you're a citizen of the yeah, United States or putting whatever. in some basic information and you know, confirming your email and maybe you have to sign. Maybe they have to send you something you sign or whatever. I don't know, but like, yeah, that's that's not unreasonable. But if it becomes like a whole like you need to let us look at your bank account and like see if you have you know, if it becomes like a PayPal kind of thing where it's just like we need to be able to see this and then have a backup funding for this and like right. then you're I think you're in. Then I think you're sort of off in crazy town, but obviously I you don't know that. Yeah, you don't know what they're doing yet. I I I have to think that with Tim Schafer and in Exile Obsidian, these guys I think that you know these guys have had huge kickstarters, hugely successful kickstarters where they delivered on them, and I think they know that that bar of entry needs to be as low as they can make it, or as easy as they can yeah. make it. You know, they you you need to you need to not have this the whatever the sign up process is be complicated or convoluted enough to dampen the enthusiasm when it comes time to actually hit that don- that invest button, not the yeah. donate button. The invest yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you're not really donating no, anymore, it's not right? a donation now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think both of us would agree we hope it succeeds. Yeah, for sure. And we hope we can both get accredited so yeah. we can actually invest in these things. <laughs> I don't know what we have to do. If we have to We're take good a, for it. We have to take Come a on. test, we'll take it. So. Yeah. All right, that's going to do it for the big six. It's time to move on to our trailer of the week. And this trailer just came out hot off the presses this morning. What else could it be? I mean, <laughs> we've been talking what about else is it anyone all doing show. This yeah. <laughs> we've been talking about it all show. And, you know, this, this trailer does have some special meaning. This will be, it's the launch trailer for Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. And it is what will likely be Kojima's last ever piece of promotional media for a Metal Gear game. And uh, I'm not going to spoil anything for you. I love how he starts it out. And you can totally see the emotion coming through Kojima in this trailer. Uh, I'm not going to say anything else. Let's just roll it.
What do you think? Ooh. That's the first time you saw that, right? Yeah, I haven't seen that before. Uh, looks pretty great to me. Like that, the the the, the fully like upright mech, erect is, mech, the in erect more ways in more bit, ways yeah. than one. <laughs> I see what you're doing there, Kojima. I see, but like we, yeah. he pulls the the whip and turns into the sword. I'm just like, that's oh, badass, that's badass, dude. Yeah, and a little, little bit of Zone of the Enders. Yeah, a little yeah. Zone of the Enders action there. I'm all, I'm in favor of Zone of the Enders action every time. Yeah, I love that whip sword though. Yeah, and it just looks. It looks uh, it looks dense. The game looks like open world, but it looks yeah. dense. It looks like it's got some some stuff to show us. A lot of feels in that trailer. Yeah, like that. Even first... as people like us who aren't completely attached to the Metal Gear story and the canon and everything, yeah, but it's, just, like... it's been. A, I mean, ever. I mean, Metal Gear for me goes all the way back to looking at those those ads for the NES version of the first Metal Gear with like all the gear. It was like it was like on the backs of comic books and stuff, and yeah. it had all the little all the items you could use, and it looks like. Remote control missile launcher, all that. And I'm like, wow, there's so many items you can. I mean, that's back. That used to be a selling point, kids. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, look how all the look at all the items you can use. You can yeah. use rations. That's yeah. crazy. You know, that just you didn't have inventories in the NES games yeah. for the most part. And uh, I remember staring at that and just being like, oh my god, I, can, I wish I could play that game. It looks awesome. And like, you know, and then like moving ahead as it, it, it. Metal Gear's been a constant presence in the game industry for almost thirty. I think that's 30, what it is. For, that's what it is for me. It's not the even idea so of much it being gone is very weird. It's not even so much that I would want like another Metal Gear. Or it's, it's just that it has been just a. It's been a part of my life. Yeah, and for like, decades. You, you always knew somewhere out there, Hideo Kojima was working on another Metal Gear, whether he liked it or not. Yeah, and I look, <laughs> like, I still remember a... like um, back when the first Metal Gear came out, and like you know I I had. An N64 and a PlayStation. My buddy only had a PlayStation, and I was playing like Ocarina of Time at the time, and he was playing Metal Gear at the time. Mm -hmm. And like we, I would go over to his place, and I'd sit there and help him like get through Metal Gear. And like, there's just there's so many memories tied up into that, and just being at all the press conferences when Konami used to have press conferences, and like 
going to those and like I remember Metal Gear Solid 2, the trailer being played at E3, and just mm-hmm. the crowds around the tra- the screen. That was one thing that really depressed me this year at E3, was they were showing the trailer for the Phantom Pain at the Konami booth, and there was just like a smattering of yeah. like 50 people. And it was like a huge open area that they had literally left open mm-hmm. so that people would come in and like watch the trailer, and there was just like 50 people just kind of standing Which there. Which they like, had to learn over. I remember, I remember when Snake Eater's big trailer was running at E3, and TGS for that matter, and like it became kind of a thing like don't go near the Konami booth if you need to get yeah. anywhere on the floor, like with your camera crew or whatever. Don't go near the Konami booth because yeah. you'll never get through it because it's just it was just people. But like, MGS2 was really like the one. Oh, like yeah. that was I mean literally when that trailer was rolling on their screen, it just took over like the whole hall and like it went silent. Yeah. Like people just walked by and stopped yeah. and just looked at it and it was like nothing else. Yeah. Even just when it when it ran some footage of it in that trailer just now, even then I you know I said like wow, that game still looks good for for PlayStation 2. Yeah. Like he they he he worked some miracles on that system. Yeah. So lots of feels for me personally watching yeah, the that. Throwing the 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 you know the, the fox, patches the, the out fox of the logos uh, yeah. logo patches out where it's just like oh like, that's what I was saying earlier I'm like I wonder how much stuff like that well, you know clearly he knew this was the this was goodbye yeah so you got to wonder if there's gonna well be just some... the fact look he's done launch trailers for all his games they've yeah. never had like a mini retrospective at the beginning of the no. launch like that's just it just doesn't happen that way. It's, gonna, so. it's, it's like if this game makes me misty, it's going to be because it does that meta thing about like right. It's going to be you know. It's not like going to be a plot twist in the no. actual story of the game. It's going to be that little those little things like that that are going to really it's get. Gonna, me. It's like it's like I said when we when we were watching the trailer. It's like the, the closest Metal Gear ever got to getting me in the feels was the end of four where Otakon says Snake had a hard life. Yeah, and I was like. He did have a hard life. That was <laughs> God. He's been around forever. Like, oh my God. And like, if and something like that, I I, I yeah. don't put it past him about you know if he if he gets in some like clever little jab that references like the length of the series, the you know the the the, the omnip- the omnipresence of the series in in the medium. And kind of like plays on that a little bit. That might that might get me. What'll get me is if he somehow manages manages to impart through the game that he didn't want to leave and quit making mm. this series. If if there's yeah. some part in that game where I get that vibe off of it, I think I'll probably get misty eyed and maybe it, mm. one solo tear will roll down. And what a, and what a, like you know my, I mean my theory based on when it takes place is that eventually it will kind of connect up with the first original Metal Gear with Outer Heaven and all that yeah. stuff, and then. The entire Metal Gear series will be Big this loop. perfect circle, yeah. and it's just. Like, I I would not count on that, by the way. Ah, uh, probably not, <laughs> but you never know. Yeah. So anyway, hope you enjoyed that trailer. I know I've watched it like three or four times now, and I've watched it from beginning to end there again. Definitely one of the better it, trailers this is year. Is that one of the best? Is that the best looking game on the consoles right now? Do you think? Mm. You played. I haven't played it in person. No, I wouldn't go that far. No. No. I mean, technically, or like yeah. all over. Technically, I guess. No, I would say The Witcher 3 is still probably still? the better looking game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, as far as... I mean, they're, most of the environments in Phantom Pain are pretty barren. Mm. Like, the open world in The Witcher is full of stuff. And this <laughs> is like the desert for the most part. Mm. So, still an amazing looking game, don't get me wrong. Yeah. So, All right, it's time to move on to our deep dive and what has undoubtedly been the biggest story from this week. Um, and maybe it is a total non-story, to be honest with you. But... Last week, someone, I think it was on NeoGAF, dug up a patent that Nintendo had filed for, and basically it was a patent for a new console that would not use any optical discs. Now, as people started digging in more, it actually became apparent that there are at least cards that are used. So, Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's SD cards or if that's like game cards like the 3DS uses, but there is some sort of storage media. It's not all flash media inside the console itself. So mm. people are like freaking out. And let's just go back right now to E3 2013. Okay. Microsoft is on stage unveiling <laughs> the Xbox One. And uh, and at that point, it, it was like, thought that... Thought that everything was going to be installed and yep. the disc would basically be useless. And that, that you would not be able to resell games yeah. and... They were really pushing for the all-digital console they were. in a very concrete way. And our fellow gamers rebelled, yes. <laughs> to put it lightly. <laughs> so we, were, we were not ready for the future. Yeah, and so that was two years ago. Yeah. 
And now we see this patent. Matt, one, do you think that people are ready for something like this now? No. I don't Me think either. so. <laughs> are you ready for this now? I don't know. I mean, I've bought a lot more full price digital games on the Xbox One and the PS4. See, than I, I am thought shocked I at how many people buy digital I still don't. I buy everything physical still. Like unless I like for review, like they send us codes mm. and we have to like download it that way. But tell you what if happens, I pay for a game, I do not buy digital. I buy happens, the game. I get I get impatient. Like and it's and it's not even the big stuff. It's the stupid little things. It's like I like I bought the Godzilla PS4 game digitally <laughs> because I got I'm the sorry. because I got to play it at 9 p.m. the day before right. instead of like buying and picking it up at GameStop or whatever the next day. Right. And I'm like, that's like hours and more time to play a, a terrible, terrible Godzilla game. Right. Right. And um and so like that's where they get me. And or something. You know, every once in a while they they have like a good like I think Mortal Kombat X had like you got that. Plus, like the bonus, like the season pass or something, and it was like yeah. seventy four bucks instead of like a hundred. Yeah, and like that, you know, a good deal will get me to jump in on that sometimes, because um, I do think digital stuff should be cheaper than physical. I do. Stuff. I agree a million percent. Yeah. But um, and maybe if it was, I would actually think about buying it. But so, but I pretty much am on the same page as you in terms of like I want a physical object that is mine to. You know, even if the inter- even if PSN goes down or Xbox Live goes down forever one day, like I can still put that disc in and play it. Um, but I am also a big impatient gorilla, so <laughs> you know, I, I sometimes I sometimes I betray my own my own ideals. Do I you guess. think Nintendo is looking at mobile and they're saying I think so for sure. This is the where it's all going. Could and- be. And look, again... No one this, has a problem this, with that on mobile, do they? Nintendo puts out tons of patents, or reserves tons of patents that ne- it never does anything with. So this could all be poppycock. Right. Like, but it just Balder spurs Nash. on a better discussion of, is the industry ready for this? Are we ready for this? And if the industry does go this direction, what are the implications of that? I, don't, I mean, I certainly don't think Nintendo's ready for it, because they're not ready to let me re-download stuff on a different system. They're yet. also not ready to give me a console with more than 30 gigs of hard drive space. Yeah, that's also a problem. <laughs> but like the, it's the main thing is that you know, I'm, I, am, I keep being really reluctant to buy digital from Nintendo more than anyone else, because like, I know they have a... Because you know, their digital's janky. <laughs> right, but they have some semblance of a universal account system now, but like, if something happens to my 3DS, I have to like call them to get them to let me put it on the new, th- a, new a replacement 3DS and like there's been people who required like police reports to prove it was stolen and stuff I mean, yeah. it, I mean it's just like why can't it just be like Sony and Microsoft or Steam where it's just like I sign in I can re-download anything I bought um, and that's it like you know it's very simple if something happens to your PS4 or your Xbox One and you can replace it you just re-download stuff but like Nintendo isn't quite that so it's weird to me that this came out of them this like non-disc idea but it makes sense in terms of like they're going know, back to carts, man. Going, going back to carts. <laughs> I think you know. I, I it wouldn't surprise me if the NX is a very retro theme retro theme console in the sense of using some kind of you know curation system or like streaming system or museum style thing where like you can have access to huge amounts of Nintendo's historical libraries. So the idea of kind of self-containing that into a Nintendo entertainment box kind of thing would make sense to NES me. NES too. <laughs> yeah, and on top of that, it's like, you know, how, you know, this certainly became a problem with the Vita. I wonder if it's going to ever be a problem for Nintendo. You, like, is there a point at which retail stores stop wanting to give Nintendo space, shelf space to Nintendo? You know, like it's how, possible. I mean, with the Amiibos flying off the shelves the way they are, I wonder if that's even an issue right now. Right. Well, I mean, the Amiibos Wii U take games, up a lot of shelf space. The Wii U games sit there, but the Amiibos sell. I mean, they move, so... Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I I don't know what their situation is like. That that's that's internal information we would never have access to. Uh, but but I wonder if the, you know some of that could be an attempt or 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 just a future proofing end run around the idea of like you know what happened to the PSP where they're like, well, we don't really want to give you any more shelf space because it didn't work before. So yeah. uh, I, it really bothers me to think of that happening to Nintendo, but. I don't is, know. Is it, is it, <laughs> it's is not it, all that far fetched. Yeah, is it an unrealistic thing? I don't. I feel like it's creepily plausible. Do you think road. Nintendo could be the one platform holder who could get away with this, though? Because I think they are. That's, I I could buy that. I mean, at this point, I think Nintendo can get away with anything. Because with their here's base. the thing, right? That's what I'm saying. Like, 
Sony and Microsoft have fickle fans. Like, it's been proven already that fans of either one of these companies are willing to change. They, look, there's a ton of people that bought Xbox 360 and swore by Xbox 360 who now own PlayStation 4s. And vice versa, it happened before. You know, there was tons of PlayStation, mm-hmm. PlayStation 2 owners who bought Xbox 360 when they realized that third-party games look better on Xbox 360. Nintendo fans don't play that, bro. Like, that's no. not, they're not leaving Nintendo to, to go and buy a PlayStation. Like, Nintendo fans are going to buy Nintendo hardware. And so I feel like Nintendo is the one of the three who could make a media-free platform. And people may complain about it a little bit, but ultimately, those same 10 million fans or whatever bought that bought the Wii U are going to buy that machine. Yeah. So, and look, if they do have what you mentioned, and it's all kind of networked in, and like you can stream the entire library of Nintendo games. I mean, because Nintendo can't rely on any one of themselves. For at this the point, no, they are on an island. Like mm-hmm. they've alienated everybody else that they used to work with. Either that, or the people that have worked with them have got burned working with them. And you're right, they can't mm-hmm. rely on anyone at this point. It's bas- and, basically all them. And if you can make that transition, if you can make that transition all digital with that system, and Nintendo can kind of step away from more having to worry about manufacturing and retail channels for the games. And then refocus themselves on the amiibo idea, maybe if that's if that's still good, because it seems to be doing very well for them to the point they're going to release a forty dollar Yoshi amiibo, um, and that becomes kind of the system becomes sort of this closed garden for them to sort of push their own stuff, and it, it's it's your Nintendo experience. Maybe that's what NX stands for. Um, I'm guessing it does. Yeah. And, and maybe that's maybe that's their 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 ticket, you know? Or maybe it's, this is the ticket, the Nintendo on. <laughs> Well, maybe we have to see how the Morpheus does first there. But, uh, Nintendo was way ahead of their time, or at least the uh, the fakers who yeah, made the this fake video. I remember when that hit. Time. I think I believed it. No, I, it I blew wanted... it blew the internet apart when this video <laughs> made it to NeoGAF, like back in the day. It literally ripped the internet asunder. Yep. Because it was so well done. People... It's so well done, and it's also like... The thing about Nintendo is, you, you know... You'd expect it. Yeah, you, you can't put anything past anything them, past yeah. them because they'll do the crazy stuff and and most of the time it works. Yeah. <laughs> Remember when everybody saw the DS and was like, what kind of crap is that? Like, yeah. what the hell? Why do I need two, why do I need two, two screens? screens yeah. And as soon as you've got that thing in your hand, it's just like, oh... Okay. Yeah. I guess or like now. the 3D, the 3DS. Like, who wants to play 3? I remember I was like, I don't. Who cares about 3D on a handheld? And I remember Reggie. We went to see. Went to the Nintendo booth. Reggie's like, Oh, have you seen it? And I'm like, No. And he, and he like put one in my hand, and it was it was like magic. Yeah. It was like whole. Like I couldn't believe. I'm like, This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. It was it, next it, to it, Nintendo it, on. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, we never got to see that. Yeah. But I remember I was just expecting a Virtual Boy extension. And I remember looking at it, and I'm just like, I can't, like, just, I just, and it just, it made that first impression on me, and it was like that Nintendo magic. Sometimes they just nail it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's the thing I wonder, because, like, I remember when, when I said that, uh, someone else in our group said, uh, you know, asked him, asked Reggie, uh, how long have you been working on this? And he said, Pretty much since the Virtual Boy, yeah. like it's like we, you know, <laughs> Nintendo had wanted to do 3D forever. Like yeah. That was like one of the things they've been iterating and iterating and iterating, and like that's when they come up with just those magic things. And I wonder how much of that iteration and how much of that thought process and how much of that process that Nintendo puts everything through can happen with the NX if they had to put it in, if they kind of had to fast track it, or is the NX something that they've had in their heads for like 15 years? And they're like, well, now it's time to pull out the, the big gun. Like, the, the yeah, thing yeah. we've always thought about doing, do it. You know, like, what, what if it's that? What if it's this thing that they've had percolating for so long that they maybe, maybe they got it? Maybe they yeah. nailed this thing. Well, let's stretch this topic outside of Nintendo a little bit because here's the thing. It's coming. The yeah. day is coming. It's already here where, on PC. Where you're right. You actually you are right. Like, you, where can you even buy physical PC games anymore? My house. I've got boxes of them. Like, who wants who wants PC discs? Like, it was, every every Sims expansion ever. I don't know what to do with it. I might make a quilt. Well, it was funny. I was building my uh, gaming PC last year, and like, I had all the components on the table, and I took a photo of all the components and put it on Twitter. And the first comment I got back was like, "Why you got an optical?" <laughs> 
And I sat there for a second, and I was like, why do I have an optical drive? And I was like, because I have all these old programs I want to install on my new PC, mm. but I can download those. Mm. But I have all these old games, but they don't really work anymore. Nope. Like, and so we're headed there for consoles. A console one of the is reasons, headed there. One of the reasons I put an optical disc in my new PC this year was so I could play Spore. Yeah. Now look. Now look. Yeah, now <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Because I love the space part of that game. So it's coming. Yeah. How long do you think it realistically it's going to take? Assuming that the NX doesn't do it. Because yeah, I, I really I, don't think it's going to. I think it's next generation. I think the next generation. You think the next generation will be this free? One, I think one of them will try it. You think? Yeah. I mean, one tried to try. Yeah. <laughs> but, that didn't go well. But the thing, I think it, whoever does it is going to have to have to have a... Going to have to have to have to have a... I don't know. I remember, it's late. It's, they're going to have to have a way to sell the game back. They're going to have to do like a Steam style like... Well, didn't the authorities in Europe say that digital games, you sh- yes, legally... there has to be a way to get a refund. Them, yeah. yeah. Um, or sell them. Or sell no, you them, You've yeah. got to sell your collection, yeah. So I think they're going to have to work out... Whoever figures that out first is going to have the road clear ahead of them to go ahead and do that. You know, and... I want you know I, I don't know what retail, retail channels are going to be an issue. I don't know how if Sony wants to because at some you got to buy the system somewhere, right? Yeah. So like, does Sony or Microsoft really want to jeopardize their relationships with those retail partners by saying, "Oh, sell our systems, but there won't be any games afterward," you know? Yeah. Because you know, what do you do with that whole section of electronics all of a sudden? Like all of a sudden, there's no games, but you can you know you want us to still sell your box yeah. so people can. Then give you more money that we don't get a piece of. Like, like there's so many politics involved a lot in kind of that move it. that you know. Just GameStop, just cutting out yeah. GameStop. I mean, you're ending brick and mortar. Yeah. Effectively, and you've got GameStop here who has supported you for literally like forever, thirty years. Yeah. And you're just like, pshaw. Like, oops. See yeah. ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. So I don't. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think the community, and the tech. Would be ready next generation. Well, I think the tech's ready, but I now, don't think. But... but I don't think. I don't. I don't. I mean, there's so many politics to play in terms of the retail channels. Maybe that's simply not in the cards. I the think they're going to have to wait for the generation after us to die before people are going <laughs> to be okay with it. Because even like the generation, I guess it's generation. We're Generation X, so they're what Generation mm. Y. I think is what they're millennials. called. millennials. Or millennials? I thought that's there was what... a Y before millennials. No, nah, Generation Y became millennials okay. pretty much. Millennials. Are in theory come like start around like eighty two or eighty three? Because millennials are fifty fifty, it seems like about half of them still are tied to physical yeah. media. Well, I still think that um, and the other half are okay with just. Physical. I think there's there should be. I think there's more generations now. I think I don't feel like we're totally Gen X. I feel like we're that tail end and kind of, you know, I think early millennial and late Gen X sort of kind of go together a little better, and then the current millennials are a different. Because I think you have to be a different type of generation. Someone who was born in 82 remembers the, the world before the internet, yeah. basically. Right. And I think there's a divide there where you grew up right. with, a, with, with the right. internet. And I think there's another divide where you grew up with smartphones. Yeah, you're right. So I think, I think generations are changing faster. We were fortunate, that. actually, because we got to get all I, of it. I loved where we were. Yeah. I, I, I loved that I, I had to change it, the channel physically. Yeah. And then we got a remote. And then we got the bigger remote. And, you know, and our we are the last fortunate generation, though, because like my parents, they're clueless. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad I was born when I was. I got to see all the old analog stuff, and I got mm-hmm. to see it all transition into digital. Yeah, um, I have, I I have like very I'm warm fortunate. feelings for 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 wood paneled televisions. Yeah. But I also don't feel the need to go back to them. Yeah. So for sure. I I remember where we came from, and I appreciate what we have now because of it. Yep. So that's going to do it for our deep dive. Matt, why don't you look for some questions right. while I wrap up the show? So that's it for episode 21 of Game Face. Like I said, we had a lot of good topics to talk about, and they're honestly just going to keep on rolling for the rest of the year. Even if we don't have crazy controversial things to talk about, there's just going to be great games to talk about pretty much every single week until the Christmas break. Um, I do want to give you an update on... Uh, the show I've been talking about for a long time. It's looking like I'm going to be able to announce the show next week. Um, the graphics are finally done. The, the people who are working on them actually went out of the country and took a bit of a vacation. Uh, and uh, so it did delay it a little bit, but we've been working on them hardcore the last couple of days, and they're almost finished. They look amazing. 
but the graphics aren't going to be anything compared to the show. You guys are going to be really excited about it. So sorry to tease it for so long. I know with a lot of things with Sifted, it seems like I say, oh, it's going to be next week, and then it's two weeks later, and it's not done. But uh, trust me when I'm being honest with you when I tell you this stuff, and things just end up getting delayed for one reason or another. So any questions from... Uh, are you serious, Matt? Uh, well, Bolvar33 wants to know what the big announcement you were going to make any day was. <laughs> um, so I think we covered that. Yeah, we definitely covered that. Uh, this is for Vigia Games. Uh, says, thoughts on Fatal Frame 5 situation? By situation, uh, do you mean that it's download only? It's digital only? Probably. That it's like a $50 game for download only on a Wii U. And it's also, the other thing too, that and he probably knows this because he asked a question, is that it's like a free-to-try game. Mm -hmm. So you can play, I think, the prologue in the first two chapters of the game for free, and then it cuts you off, and then mm -hmm. you got to pay to keep playing. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't have a Wii U. I feel like you know, I don't think their holiday lineup is particularly strong. I think there's a lot of games, but there's, there's a lot of games. No, like, but there's sure a lot fire, of. Yeah. Oh, here's the thing. I love Fatal Frame and I love Xenoblade, so I want those two games for sure. I yeah. want those two games, but I have to admit that I'm like. Their holiday, Nintendo's holiday lineup is some B team yeah. stuff. I mean, it's all B level stuff. You know, and and I'm fine with that because I like a lot. You know, but like the stuff I like, I recognize is very niche. And if if I had to see, if look, if Star Fox, if they had actually put some effort into that game and yeah. polished it up, like that could have been a triple A game. Yeah, but but I Star think Fox we, has always kind of been B team. Well, Star bit. Fox 64. I mean, for the N64, that was. That was pretty high production values, yeah, man. Yeah, but, it, but is, Star, is, is Star Fox really a, a Mario or a Zelda? Oh, or no, no, of course or not. Or Pokemon? But, like it's, but still, I would have. I'm a little disappointed in Star Fox. Is what sure. I'm getting at. Like, I feel like they could have done a lot more yeah. with it in today's. But day Fatal age. Frame. Um, you know what? I'm just happy to see a Fatal Frame make it to U.S. shores. Again. And I think it's cool, honestly. I think it's a good idea to let people try games yeah, for a little not? bit. It may be a little torturous if you play it, but it's better than not playing it at all, right? Yeah. So I'm actually totally cool with it. Um, I feel like Fatal Frame, if they, they if they're going to do retail for that, they probably never would have released it in the U.S. at all. Yeah. So Say it's like Yakuza. It's like yeah. look, I'm, it's a, just good they're giving it to us. Yeah. Because otherwise, form. you probably wouldn't have got the game. So I'm totally cool with it. Any other questions? Um, Consolized asks, do you think Mario Maker will be ported to NX and become its own platform? So I don't know if you guys saw or not, but we did a live stream of Super Mario Maker. It was a two-hour live stream. Uh, that happened over the weekend. We're going to be doing a lot more of that going forward. I realize a lot of you guys missed it who watch Game Face. Um, it's called Saturday Hangout, and we did Mario Maker for the first one. And what I've realized playing Mario Maker for review is that it kind of makes you wonder if there will ever be another 2D Mario game. Because after you start messing around with the levels that these people have created, some of these levels are actually better than a lot of the levels that I play in, like, legit Mario games that I've paid, like, 50 or 60 bucks for. So... Mm -hmm. It's going to be a hard sell for Nintendo to come to you from now on and say, hey, here's another 2D Mario game. Give us $50 or give us $35 for a handheld one. Like, it's the sky is the limit. It, it, they give you, like, tool sets from, like, you know, the Wii U game and the Wii game and the original NES version. It's like, now that that game is here, there's very little reason to ever buy a 2D Mario. And I don't know, I'm sure Nintendo thought about that, but... It doesn't look like mm. it because they give you so many tools. I mean, there are some levels, Matt, where you don't have to do anything. Like, literally, <laughs> you just hold right and hit run, and they have set up the whole level so it just jettisons you through the whole level. Like, some of the levels are genius. Like, <laughs> it is crazy. And so, after playing this, I wonder what the value is in any 2D Marios made by Nintendo going forward. So... What was the question again? <laughs> um, will it become its own platform, and I, you know, or will it be ported to the NX? And I'm, I have to think. Yes. After the, either yes or like Mario games are just going to include this now. Yeah, I mean you're right. I mean they, they look they've included pre-made levels in this too. Like there's a little mm -hmm. mode in Super Mario Maker where you have ten lives to get through eight le pre-made levels. So, I mean there's still kind of something they created in there. Yes, I think it'll totally be ported to NX. I think this is something that's going to live on forever, just like Minecraft is. I mean, it's basically a tool to build your own games. Everybody knows how popular those are right now. I think it's going to be really successful, and yeah, I think it'll be available for NX. And uh, oh, Tom and D wants to know if he will do, you will do a Mario Maker follow-up where the uh, Sifted community gets to send in levels and you have to try to beat them. I would love to do that. I think that's a great idea. Although, based upon how horribly I played during that stream, I had not played a 2D Mario in probably like a year. And uh, 
I played horribly for the first like hour of that stream. Like the second hour, I finally started getting in the groove and started getting better. But man, <laughs> it, some of those levels weren't even hard. So I don't know. That may be uh, might be a little tough. But yeah, I just would lo- I would love to do that. I would love to get more involved with the community in general. Just playing games with you guys, um, sharing levels back and forth for any game. Uh, all that type of creative stuff I'd love to work more with you guys on. So. And let's do one more. Last one. Last yeah. one. Uh, go back up a little bit to Dogface Pig, who asks, where do you think Kojima will go next? Kickstarter, a new Sony studio? Hmm. Honestly, I think he may just start his own thing. Yeah. Generally, people who get burned at corporations or have a bad experience at a corporation, and they were successful at that corporation, but ultimately the split wasn't amicable, a lot of times they split off and do their own thing because they don't want to get put in a position where they get screwed again. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even saying Kojima was screwed. I mean, it sounds like there's two sides of this story. He blew through the budget. Konami treated him like crap. I don't think either one of them did things the right way. Um, But I would be really surprised if he were to just sign on with some other developer or some other publisher. Like, I could see him signing an exclusive publishing deal with a publisher yeah. and being like, hey, I'm going to build this studio, I build another studio, and yeah. every game that we create, we will sign a deal with you guys and we'll make it just for you. Whether it's a publisher or Sony or Microsoft. I think Sony would be smart. It makes sense yeah. with his games and his brand, but uh, I don't see him just like, Working for somebody for else someone, again. Yeah, he doesn't need not. to either. I mean, he has so much money. It's like he could be his own boss. I really just don't see that happening. So yeah. I think he will break off and do his own thing. And in fact, I there hope we, he does. There we go. Uh, he joins Nintendo oh. for the NX. That's never happening. <laughs> no, I don't think so. That would be pretty. That would be pretty amazing. That would be amazing. <laughs> you know how much money Nintendo would have to give him for that yeah. to happen? Yeah, and it might be worth it for them. Honestly, <laughs> I mean, who knows? It is Kojima, and he's crazy, and Nintendo's kind of crazy, and, and, and crazier things have happened, yeah, so... Yeah, crazier things, yeah, never, never, I don't put anything past either of them. You're right, that's probably a good way to look at it, but I would say the more likely option is that he starts his own thing. Yeah, yeah. Kickstarter, he doesn't need your money. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Although he still might take it. <laughs> yeah, fax hand. I mean, it could be, be a case where he starts his own studio and then just does a Kickstarter to get the funding for his first game. Or at least, like, the seed funding. Or maybe he I, uses I would Fig. Be, yeah. What if he were what if he's the, fig the first Fig? Yeah. Maybe we figured it out. Ooh. That could be it. We'll see. Anyway, we're totally running over time, so we got to get out of here. As always, thanks for your support of Sifted. Love you to death, Sifters. Uh, we will be seeing a lot more of us in the coming weeks. And uh, like I said... We'll be doing a lot more Let's Plays with Saturday Hangouts, but this week we will not be doing one because of PAX. So stay tuned to the site this week, by the way, for PAX. Obviously, we'll be curating all the best stuff from the show. And as you guys have learned already, there's no comparison to Sifted during a trade show. So see you guys on the site, Sifters. Have yourselves a good week. Game Face is up and out. (laughs) 